Hello, everybody. Boy, this week has been busy. Busy, busy, busy. And the weather has been really weird here in Maryland. Uh, I don't know if you've been watching the uh, weather service, but today it was like, what, 65 degrees? Some crazy, crazy temperature. I saw a girl running around in little shorts and little tank top today. It, this is mid-January, folks. I mean, come on. Yeah. It's crazy. I don't know what's going to happen for the rest of the month, but it's been nice. At least we were out, you know, having fun today. We went out to uh, eat lunch with a couple of uh, friends of ours, and uh, I got back in time this time. Yeah. So anyway, lots of questions have been asked, and people are still asking the same questions all over again. So I would recommend, uh, again, somebody sort of like admonished me for creating videos that were just basically re- hashing previous basic subjects and i really don't know what else to do i mean what else can i do to get people to just go to a playlist and just look at it and i bet you i bet you the video that will answer your questions is in there somewhere again all you got to do is look for the subject cli42 modification i got a playlist with multiple videos going through every aspect of this process and in other semi-related aspects about modifying these cartridges. Um, again, you want to learn about color management? You want to learn about profile creation? Color Managed Workflow Playlist is there, is there. So rather than, you know, waste time looking at it over, it's got to be like 13 and a half hundred, 1350 some odd videos. Don't do that. Don't waste your time doing that. I know I would not want to do that through somebody's channel if they had that many videos. I know a channel that has 5,000 videos and the guy never created playlists. How am I going to find something in that channel? You see what I'm saying? So I've gone through the trouble and it takes some time to do that. Video by video, you assign it to a playlist. It could be also a couple of playlists because it could be it could be a related topic that pertains to that video. I put it on two playlists. Again, you will find that if you just go to any playlist that calls your attention or you know gets your attention. So again, it'll just save you a ton of time as I make more and more videos and more videos get added. It's going to be more and more difficult for you guys. And even for me, when I try to find a video that somebody is asking about, have you ever made a video on this or that subject? And I go, well, yeah, about a year and a half ago. It still pertains today because the process never changes. Okay. What you did five years ago, you're still doing it today. It still applies even to modern up-to-date printers and Guess what? Yeah, I've been looking at all the um, consumer electronic show videos. I even added Epson or Canon printer next to my search criteria. Not a one, at least nothing I could find. I hope someone else, one of you guys have been a little bit more successful and found some new products out there. There just isn't, okay? There just isn't, unfortunately. So, let me see who else we got here. We have a few people here. We have 13 folks here with us. I just recently posted a welcome to all of the new members to the Facebook group. So, I'm, I'm getting a lot of little messages here because people do react. I guess no one does this. They should be saying hello to any new members of any Facebook group. But I guess a lot of these moderators are just too busy or just don't think that that's really necessary. I think it is. I think it's a, a very nice way to um, um, tell the new members that, yeah, we do appreciate you. We do see you. So we are about, I think it's like 3,500 now. So that's really good. And we're going to be covering so much stuff today. I hope we have the time. I want to keep it under three hours, but you know me when I get talk, get to talking, I kind of go off in certain tangents sometimes. So hopefully that will not happen. So 
Recently, I uploaded a video where I took you through the steps, and not just the steps, but the a kind of a, a, a sh showing you what you really need to perform your CLI 42 Pro 100 cartridge modification. Yes, the most popular printer for photos in the world. Okay, probably the best thing that Canon ever produced. And so it is very popular and everybody wants to, you know, immediately switch over to third party. So I laid out right here the same supplies that I showed you on the video. But I'm going to just kind of hit you guys that are here, here with me this weekend and show you exactly what you need. But let's just wait a little while while we get more people on board. We got 16 folks, three likes only. Come on. Hit that like button, please. And also tell us who you are, where you are from. We have one, two, three, four, five people who are sharing with us who they are. What do they go by name wise and where they are watching or listening from? So that's what we need because this is a community. We have a good camaraderie with everybody here. I, you know, so far so good. No one has really been, you know, a bad actor, if you will. And so we just love doing this. And again, it's all about sharing your own experiences. If you come on here, tell us who you are, where you're from, tell us what printer you're currently using. If you even have one, it doesn't matter if you have one or not yet. This is a place to come so that you can possibly make that decision. And we're going to be just as frank as can be. Okay. We're going to hold nothing back. I'm going to tell you the ins and outs. I'm going to tell you why you should not do this or why you should do this. It all depends on your circumstances. So let's say howdy to everybody here. Henry Stoffel, Boston. 70 today in Boston. That's way up there in the Northeast. That is nuts. So we'll see what's going to happen this coming week. I mean, it's been wonderful. Again, I've been out flying a little bit. It was a bit windy the other day. The last few days, uh, we had some rain, but you know, it's been, it's been nice. Otherwise, my flowers are coming up. Oh my gosh. All my crocuses are coming up in the front. And it's January, not even mid-January yet. It's nuts. Um, let's see, my username 360, three, no, I'm sorry, Dilex, the Dilex, uh, I'm Dilexic. So 630, my username 6, 630. Fred from San Mateo, California, didn't know you were going to be live today. I'm live every Sunday, okay? Every Sunday at four o'clock, like clockwork get it and so yeah that's when you can join us again and be armed with every question that you may have uh whatever you want to share with us that would be you know awesome one of these days i'm going to try another type of broadcast software that will allow you guys to also join us i mean by video and audio so we'll create panels so that everybody can be you know, here, like, like you're, like we were all in the same room, so to speak. So you would need a type of web camera. I'm using a Logitech uh, 1080p, just a cheapy little camera from eBay and a microphone connected to the computer. I give you a link. You click on the link. You accept a couple of little things here and there, and then you are live. And I will then put you up and that way we can actually talk. Okay. You don't have to do any typing any longer. And that would be the best way. And I'm going to experiment with that. So you might see a live stream notice coming up this coming week. Just jump in. If you happen to have a web camera and a microphone, you can jump in and join us. But I'm going to go ahead and be testing that next week. So, All right. So So my username, you're going to watch us later. Okay, so this will be a video that you're going to access at a later date once you, uh, once we get off the air, if you will. So Guido here from uh, Bruges in Belgium and Charles Verbruggen also from Antwerp, Belgium. So you have a couple of people from Belgium, the place where I stayed three and a half glorious years and our son was born there, actually. Uh, I have never had a better time 
I'm telling you, it was awesome. I was with Shape, if you guys know what Shape is, in uh, Maziers, Belgium, um, the French side. So let's see what else. <laughs> my username says, you cost me to purchase my 100. Thank you. As long as you're enjoying it, I'm glad you got it. And we're going to take you through all the steps you need. So please hang with us. Don't go away yet. We have 21 people right here. We got eight likes. That makes no sense, guys. Come on. Let's go. Hit that like button. I don't know why you're not doing that. It takes about that amount of effort. Okay. Always like a channel that you want to support. All right. So we have Andre, Anders W. from Sweden. Badger Tail from Albuquerque, New Mexico. His name is Scott Duran. Uh, Blue Driftwood, Driftwood Beach from Brunswick, Georgia. Just got my Pro 100 a couple of weeks ago. Awesome. I stayed in uh, Brunswick one time I was driving to Florida. That was our midway stop. Um, Mark Y, Mark from Chino Hills, California. Fairly new to P800, still works a blessing from an Epson. I hope you're enjoying that. I'm going to show you a couple of prints that I just did. No, actually, not on the P800, the Pro 1000. P800 is wonderful. Roll support, can't beat it. That would be my, my only printer I would keep if I had to get rid of everything else, the P800, just because of that roll support. And also the ability to print ridiculously long panoramas. I mean, if you ever have a need for that, if you're one of those guys that shoots and then stitches like 12 images, yeah, you'll be able to print 100 and whatever. Maybe they claim 500 something inches in length, which is beyond, you know, my ability to comprehend. So anyway, uh, Homer, Homer Yates from uh, Northern California is here. Cliff Fit from Denmark, of course, Epson P600. Badger Tail says Canon Pro 10. My username, 3630. I keep saying 360. Great news, he says. Okay, so I think that's in, in response to something here. Um, Robert Leconti, Lecomte. Good evening, Bob. So where are you from, Robert? Mark Y. Roll is why I have the P800. Yeah, same here. Ta -ta Tade, oh boy, okay. T A D E U S Z, and then 12 from Montreal, Quebec, Belgium, the home of the chips with mayonnaise. Yummy. Yes, we were just talking about that today. Yes. I like to go to these uh, restaurants around here. We have a lot of Peruvian restaurants where they make that delicious chicken over a wood fire i mean it's amazing and then they fry little chips if you will of yuca a, a root you know and it's really really delicious and i was just telling my son about because he doesn't remember belgium um the pommes frites that you buy in the corner you know and there you dip them in mayonnaise ketchup what's that nobody knows what ketchup is at least back in the early 80s when we were there and gosh, I miss that. I'm telling you. All right. So he has a Canon Pro 10 with PC inks. That's for precision colors inks. And uh, he's getting great results. I just printed a batch of prints for that same friend we were out to lunch with today. He's their family historian. He's always giving me images to print for him. And I just do it for nothing. I tell him, just buy me lunch. And so that's what he does. And uh, gosh, that Pro 10 is just so easy to use. Such a, such a pleasure to use and the results are going to be permanent pretty much because i'm using nothing but oem inks on it i refilled my cartridges with oem inks that i get from 700 ml cartridges or just pulling them out of the pg29 cartridges that i was getting before i still have a bit of uh, ink still stored away so i can go ahead and refill as much as i want from those and guarantee the best results possible mark y says when you are ready how do you clean the rollers on a P800? Well, unfortunately, like the Pro 1000 or Pro 10, Pro 100, they have a cleaning roll, a roll cleaning utility built in. 
Epson way I'm I'm talking ages ago had the roller cleaning sheets okay and what that was because there's no way you're going to physically get in there and do a proper cleaning it was a semi tacky type paper and you could only use it a few times because after a while the, the tackiness would be gone and you just feed those papers through it you load it and then you hit the paper feed button and it would send that sheet through the rollers and that stickiness would pick up any lint dust crap that was building up on the rollers and you just did that every couple of months and you were good to go i don't know if that's still available that was really really neat and what i would suggest you could do today today um is simply um as far as you can reach with you know paper towels and maybe a bit of a some household cleaner or maybe just plain water and just go over the rollers that you can reach um, those internal rollers i'm telling you it's very difficult to get to them and so what else can you do well keep a very clean environment okay um i would say stay away from these fine art papers but gosh they're so they're so wonderful that you just simply can't print only rc papers they don't have any lint on the paper base all of these fancy papers all of these rag papers um 100 cotton rag papers those papers will have lint on them and some of the really really high-end papers i forget which one of the epsons is right now but the surface is very very susceptible to like losing little flakes of the coating these papers are so bad in 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 this way okay they print beautifully but you have to brush them before you print on them because if you do not you will be printing over all of these little loose bits of coating if you will and then that falls off afterwards with handling and you end up with all of these little white dots because you printed over the dust that the, the, the little loose chips i guess you want to call it of coating material and so you don't want to do that so the idea being that um you want to load that paper as clean as possible so that you don't end up with white spots but all of this loose material if you will fibers and dust from the surface that just comes right off the coating gets stuck in the rollers the rollers are supposed to be sticky so they they can transport the paper accurately right they need to grab the paper no slippage i mean it needs to be you know you have to rely on that unfortunately environmental conditions if you have a cat that crawls on top of your printer if you have an expensive printer and you're not covering it then you know you're you're inviting anything from the environment to start messing up your rollers okay um epson really doesn't have a very good cleaning utility like canon does so i would just suggest get in there and just do the best you can uh, one of the old tricks was to take a piece of paper as wide as a printer can handle fold it in half wet the lower half with um, like a low percentage alcohol solution maybe 50 percent alcohol leave the upper half dry feed it as relatively heavy paper something cheap not not inkjet coated paper just something you buy at the you know the the, the office store like copy paper and then just press the feed button it's supposed to go through it's supposed to wetness will you know pick up any garbage and then the white part the dry part i should say will clean and dry the rollers for you and you could do this once or twice but again using alcohol this is what they recommend it's not really good for rubber so it's not something that i would do constantly it will eventually harm your your transport rollers all right I probably spent too much time explaining that, but that's just the way I am. Okay, now. And Guido says, and don't forget the Belgian beer. Yeah, you know what? I'll tell you something hilarious. When I got there, and again, remember I was Army. I went to the Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe shape, and I was a photographer for them. So I work uh, in the secure area of the building and um when we were staying at a hotel waiting for housing to become available um this was a hotel run by the government by the military um 
I kept seeing these big posters with this pretty girl, and it says Stella Artois. I thought she was a star, some kind of local movie star. I didn't know it was beer. Yeah. Later, I found out. And so, yeah. <laughs> Silly me. Mark Y says, also, do not need to clean the rollers if not doing borderless prints. I also do not need to clean the rollers. Well, the rollers are not going to get dirty from printing uh, borderless. Uh, the the plate and sponges will. Okay. That's what that's where the overspray goes. Uh, the the head print the head is only laying ink at a very narrow area from right to left right across that area where the paper emerges and you got like maybe maybe about an inch worth of space where the head travels across that's where the ink is laid and so when it goes to the edge of the paper it still is laying ink because it has to print beyond the edges so that's where the you know that's where the overspray comes from. And it'll do it to the right, and it'll do it to the far left. And so that overspray gets basically dumped on the sponges. You'll see the sponges. Just open up your lid, and you will see sponges. They are actually located at specific areas. That is why you cannot print borderless with any kind of weird custom-sized paper. They're only set at specific widths, like 8 inches, like 4 inches. And so on, like five inches. So you can print four by six, five by seven, and eight by ten. And then after that, I think the next one is maybe eleven for your eleven by seventeens, and then thirteen, if that is a thirteen inch printer, or seventeen if that happens to be a seventeen inch printer. So they're not you cannot overspray anywhere. It's it's specific areas. That's why. Borderless printing is, is basically, um, what's the word, restricted to specific standard paper sizes. The minute you create something like a 14 by, yeah, you can't print borderless anymore, okay? But it goes on to the, the sponges and not the rollers. Super high-end printers will have some kind of vacuum system that takes care of that overspray. It actually sucks it and sends it to a maintenance type cartridge. So your interior remains nice and clean. Okay. But again, we're talking about like, you know, the big ones, the big high, high end units, thousands, lots of money. All right. Tade, Tade, you s z12 that's what i will call you oh yeah belgian chocolate instant waistline expander sure um my wife and i went to the um uh, factory one of the uh, belgian chocolate factories there on a tour that was fun i tell you and we went to a tasting room where we got to enjoy a lot of that gorgeous and delicious chocolate will carson says hello from southern california who said do you think the new or future inks from Precision Colors will approach in longevity to OEM inks. Canon Ink Pro 10. Uh, no. The reason being is that, you know, the raw materials from which these inks are made by these third-party ink laboratories are not the ones that the contracted laboratories for Canon and Epson have access to. Believe me, if they did, you wouldn't be saving money because they would be expensive the raw products are expensive people say oh no they're making this thing for you know pennies an ml no they're not no they're not the there is a big difference in the raw products especially the dyes for pro 100 pigment inks not so much actually you know the current pc ink set for the pro 10 will probably have pretty good longevity because again you're dealing with pigment inks pigment inks are particles particles that are color chemically i mean that's the chemical you know um, makeup of those those pigments so they are they will be magenta color or reddish color they will be orange for those printers that use orange they will be yellow and so on. so they will last a lot longer than you know dye inks third-party dye inks of course uh but again never as long as oem because of the difference 
in the raw products. This is what it was explained to me, okay? And it wasn't by a salesperson or, or somebody trying to pull the wool over my eyes. That's what they told me. And I said, okay, that makes sense. They just don't have access to those materials. Even, even Inkjet Mall that has a lab in China exclusively making inks for them, they do not have access to those products either. They have just been able to develop the same techniques that Epson uses because they only sell Epson inks or inks for Epson printers, not Canon. So they're able to microencapsulate those tiny little microscopic pigment particles, just like Epson does. So rather than suffer from gloss differential, like a lot of these third-party pigment inks do, horrendous gloss differential, okay? You need to spray them with something that'll even out the gloss differential so they'll look even. Um, cone inks are as good as Epson when it comes to gloss, okay? They actually perform even better, sometimes even a little bit glossier than Epson. Uh, but as far as longevity, eh, Ardenberg already did a test and they fall short. They fall short as well. So, hey, you got to protect your prints. You have to do something to enhance that longevity, regardless of what you are using. Okay. And, you know, whether it's spraying, whether it is uh, laminating, like some people actually do that, or just simply put them on, on their glass. Again, I have lots of framed prints that are still fine. I got one at the house, at, La at Nathan's house, that's been out by a window facing north. It used to be in the sunroom, and we didn't call it the sunroom for nothing. And it still looks good. And I did it with early versions of pigment inks. And I think it was from another ink company. Not, not you know, not, um, um, you know, Precision Colors, which is what I, what I normally use now. So again, it, it's not going to come close. OK, um, the only time that third party products come close, if if the original was not that great to begin with. OK, and the third party companies can have access to the materials that they are using to produce their products. Then you pretty much get an equal. What you may end up with is lower cost of production. And that's handed down to the customer as being a lower cost of use. So you'll be able to say print something specific size for a lot less money than you would when you're buying something with an inflated price. But it's still the same, you know, quality. Okay, let's see what else we got here. Nick Santoleri is here. I just had a consult with him on the phone, and I think it was very successful. I hope you did enjoy it. Um, again, Always, always great to have one-on-one um, -on, -one on the phone with folks. Usually, I end up solving whatever problems they had or questions that they needed answers to. Mark, why? How about vacuuming the rollers? Yeah, you could do all sorts of things. Do whatever. It's, it's basically common sense. You will go in there. You will look and say, oh, gosh, this area is kind of dirty. Okay? Clean it. And clean it just using, you know, mild household cleaners. Um, if you're worried, just use, you know, water, dilute Windex, if you will, even more, and use that to clean any kind of, if you see any kind of like on the silver, uh, platen strip, which is bright chrome, like you will see ink, you will see if you have any kind of a, because it'll be deposited in the, in the shape of like maybe just a little vapor. Okay. Wipe that up. Any ink where it should not be, will end up being transferred eventually if you build it up enough onto your prints. And the last thing you want is that last six inches of a beautiful, gorgeous print coming out with a smudge on it. And you'll go like, oh, God. Yeah, and they have to start all over again. Then you might end up with another smudge. Who knows? So keep the inside of your clean, printer clean. Uh, don't be too invasive be more passive about it but you know if it's visible and reachable clean it okay don't mess around with the perch pad too much because you could dislodge that that's that's actually floating on some springs it's supposed to be able to flex because the printhead comes over and just lands on it okay lands like a drone right on the uh, right on the uh, takeoff or landing pad well the printhead does that it just lands on it and it seals itself onto the gasket so 
clean that gent gently with long q-tips once in a while okay and that will keep it from uh, losing that sealing action you lose the seal and then you cannot develop vacuum any longer your cleaning cycles that you may need to perform will be useless you're leaking you're leaking vacuum air and so not, ink is not being sucked out to clean a possible clog you may have developed so keep those areas clean that's all okay uh, Stephen Polvoy from Toronto Ontario Canada we're where we had a record rainfall yesterday oh wow um as long as it wasn't snow i hate those those God. i remember here you know having we did have a three foot blizzard one time that just paralyzed everything the government closed down for a week and so again we just stayed home and enjoyed it but you know at least we had a lot of food and milk and bread and eggs and all of that and the power did not go out Ends print co or company is it easy to clear the code after emptying the waste ink tank on an epson 4880 um actually you're dealing with a cartridge not the printer like you would on a on a regular desktop model that does not have a waste ink cartridge um i think going way back to that model 4880 is kind of old at this point uh, yeah, you can reset those chips and the top of the, let me see, let me see. The top of the cartridge is like a grid that you remove. You expand the size, pop the grid out, remove all that saturated, you know, absorbent material and replace it with anything. It could be whatever absorbs water-based liquid, okay, will work. You reset it and I think if I am not mistaken even way back you would need two cartridges because the memory of the waste the waste cartridge chip system is not like the ink cartridges it only has room for one id code and the id code it is a non it's only read only if, if you will so um you need if you have two cartridges, you, you will have two different ID codes. So you need to reset the levels with your resetter, but then you need to pop another cartridge in that it hasn't seen yet. You see, it, it will then say, hey, oh, welcome, a new ID code. You must be a different cartridge. Let me erase the previous ID code, okay? Then you take that one out and you pop the one that you reset previously after you repacked it. And it will say, hey, I've never seen you before either. I will accept that ID code, even though it was the one that was previously on there, because it will it will only remembers one, okay? One code, that's it. So you can continue to do this, basically, as long as the printer will last. So uh, as to what resetter to use, I have no idea, really. I really don't, because that's quite a while ago. I don't know what the uh, OEM maintenance cartridges go for at this point. I know the ones for the 3880, 3800s are like, you know, 20 bucks, 23 bucks. So if it's too much of a pain in the, you know what, for you to do that, then just buy new ones. You know, uh, I hate to be throwing them in the environment, you know, in the trash because they end up in an anfield. It's just a box full of gunky black ink. I wouldn't want that on my... Uh, buried in my front yard no i would not all right tango says especially the belgian beer. Oh, you're still talking about belgian beer yes we'll talk about that some other time okay let's let's stick with printers right now um mr hertz hello from northern michigan stephen polvoy says he just got his new 24 inch hp z9 something printer delivered this past week and you told us about that last week so the hp rep is coming to set it up and train me in the next few weeks i'm excited learn how to use it yeah hey do some videos show us how to do the uh internal uh profiles that would be great to learn to do that drone worship woo 
you owe me a stream about the Bebop 2 camera out of focus. All right. Yes, we're going to do that. This thing is sharp as a tack. Oh, my God. Yes, I cannot believe the quality I'm getting with that. Okay, now I'm worried that my other Bebop is not quite as sharp with an untampered camera. One that has not been exposed to 15 degrees ridiculous temperatures outside, which is what I have been told by uh, not all, no, uh, what is it, um, Anthony Vlog. He said that that's the cause of this uh, blurry condition that cannot be reset after after it takes place. After exposing it to super cold temperatures, that's it. You got to remove the lens out of the barrel and play around and re yeah what i did was i removed it and we'll talk about that when we do your live stream i want to jump in and do that uh, with you we'll talk exactly what i did i will show you i'll take the nose cone out of my viva and show you what it looks like it's, it's not pretty but it works beautifully all right thank you for the super chat by the way my friend you really did not have to do that you know that okay but i appreciate that and uh i've been watching you uh today you were live i believe and i missed it because we were out you were, you, you know, you, you were on and I was not available to come and see you, man. So there'll be other times, I guarantee you. And I'm glad you're back home, okay, and in one piece and doing really well. I, I, I see the difference, man. I see a huge difference in you. Awesome. Mark Wise says, why, what kind of rag would you use to clean the rollers? Lintless, obviously, yes even paper towels and there are there are so many brands of paper towels my daughter uses some that are just really thick and and cottony looking but they don't they don't shed any any lint at all so that's what i would use and you know dilute some windex and get window cleaner just dilute it and spray it on your on your paper towel and just wipe the interior and then finish with water that that that's all you need Charles Verbruggen says, uh, thanks, Tango. The same to you. Uh, M. Hertz says, uh-oh, oh, got to go. We'll watch you later, okay? Nice nice to have you. Uh, Guido says, Tango, blah, blah, blah. Okay, everybody's talking to each other. That's good. Uh, he says, Tango says, haha, the 4880 printer. Problem solved by printer Alzheimer. Such a funny explanation. Great, was it? Okie dokie. I like that one, though. And Sprint Company says, thanks so much. Harold Goldberg, okay. Hello from Warm and Sunny Richmond. Mark Y says, thanks. And Tade USZ12 says, just say Tad. Okay, I will say Tad. Question, why do my prints sometimes have a quarter size? What? Have a quarter size in one corner of the page on 13 by 19 A3 plus paper using my Pro 10 under mac os okay you got me there so as you said mac os let me show you guys let me show you guys and i i am sure that this is not the way that the mac driver for the printer is so we're talking about what now pro 10 let me let me look up the pro 10 and again we're gonna i think we're gonna be here a long time because i haven't even gotten to my plan topics yet so let's go ahead and find us the pro 10 and i'm going to go ahead and right click and i'm going to show you the same thing but on epson so we're going to open that pro 10 is our def let me see right here in uh, preferences so this is what we get when we look at the driver in windows okay and of course, it's going to be different. So we have one, two, three, four, five tabs. And so let's just say we're going to pick the size that you just um, stated right here. A3 plus 13 by 19. Okay. So page setup. You want to make sure that this is set to same as paper size. So you have the page size. Page size, although it is somewhat related to the paper size, 
It's not. It's basically the layout, the space onto which you will lay an image onto. Okay. The printed or printer paper size has to be the same as paper. You see that? Same as page size, I mean. Okay. So if this is something else, then that's why you're getting, and this is extremely common, guys. This is exactly what happens when these two do not match, okay? And on Epson, it does the same thing. So make sure that when you look at this page setup, and again, I don't know whether that's going to exist on the, you know, the, the Mac driver, because for whatever the reason, no one has decided what a driver should look like. The user interface should be identical, whether it's Windows and whether it's Mac. The people who write the drivers are who? Who are these folks? People from Canon, people from Epson, people from HP. Okay, do you get what I'm saying right here? You see this? This is what you should get. Your, your input, let's just say, size should be the same as your output size. Okay, and by output, I mean the actual paper. So this is printer page size, where this is page size. Okay, this is where you lay your image down. Same thing happens on the Epson. Let's look at that. So say I pick, um, again, one of the larger paper sizes, 17 by 22. Okay, big print. And I go to my page layout, same as paper size. You see that? So this has to be correct, okay? Otherwise, you're going to get a print just kind of thrown over to one of the corners like you are experiencing now. So that's what happens. All right. And again, I, I don't get why Canon and Epson, you know, the top dogs in photo printers right now, simply just don't get together and say, hey, and, you know, don't even have to get together. Just the folks at Epson, P800, let's make a driver that is identical. I don't care if they change the Epson to look like a Mac driver. Do it. Whatever. It's fine. As long as both drivers are the same. They have the same tabs, the same windows, the same settings, the same way you approach color management. Okay? So that you have to go through the same number of hoops, let's just say. And don't make me go through so many hoops that I have to take a course in order to learn how to do this. Come on. Make it simple. Okay, Q image right now, Q image ultimate handles color management pretty much automatically for you. It will set the driver correctly. If you inside Q image say I want to use an ICC profile to print on this given paper, this given printer, and this given set of ink, something that I may be created myself, or if I'm using OEM everything, I just choose the OEM paper profile. And again, if I told the driver to choose XYZ paper, and it is a brand designed for that printer, the ICC profile will be correctly chosen for you. And then the driver will be automatically set to no color management or no color matching in Canon printers. And if you go to the driver and say, hey, wait a minute, I want to let the driver control color for whatever reason. And I just, you change that inside Q image. You tell it to let the driver control color. Boom, you get a little announcement that says that the driver settings have been changed for you. In other words, they, they set it to ICM matching instead of none. None would be you're printing with an ICC profile manually through Q image or Photoshop or whatever you use. Yeah, it's wonderful and pretty much dummy proof, okay? That just happened the other day to me. I was printing something and I wanted to make a demonstration that I'm going to share with you in a minute. If I just stop talking, I will share this with you. And then we're going to go ahead and do the the IC, the uh, CLI-42 uh, things that you need, okay? We'll go ahead and do that. Let me quickly finish this up. Yeah, Mac OS drivers never is nowhere near specific as Windows. 
I try to follow the way that you go through the different tabs and the way the things the things that are you know grayed out and so forth. And good lord, it just doesn't make sense to me. Of course, I've never been a Mac user. Those who don't use Mac and you know that are religiously you know loyal to the Mac system, they know how to do it. To them, it makes sense. It's logical. To me, it does not. Again, don't hate me for it. That's just the way I am. Um, but again, I would just love to have that user interface just be identical and the way you handle things be identical or as, as close to identical. So if I tell you, hey, look for this setting and you go, that setting doesn't exist on my driver. What do you mean it doesn't exist? It's a very critical setting. It should be there. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. All right. Sali Elimelech. You can talk a little about PSography printing. Thanks for bringing that up. In which printer can be purchased to enjoy this type of print, if possible through prices like the Canon Pro 10? No, not the Canon anything. Only Epson. Okay, only Epson. That's the catch. Okay, a Tango just gave us a 5 euro super chat. Thank you so much. I love QImage for printing. Brought, bought it after watching your videos. Thank you, man. Appreciate that. Let's get down to CLI 42s. Okay, let's go ahead and do that. Gosh, I, we're going to be here all night if I continue this way. All right, so you, you start with your OEM cartridge. Boom. There it is. This cartridge is what I used to print all of these test photos, okay? And as you can see, I printed baby... Oh gosh, I would say uh, about five times three, about 15, 12 by something. I was No, nine by 12 prints. And look at the levels. I don't know if you can see the liquid chamber. It just has a little bubble of air on top. Yeah. I tell you, the factory cartridges, to me, they are overfilled. They really are. Like when I'm refilling now, I would never go that high. And yet... There's no ink in the inside the um, the um, serpentine vent, okay? That will not happen when you start refilling, okay? So be careful about that. So what do you need? Well, you need your original cartridge. You use it. We talk about yellow only because this is the only one we're going to ever flush. We don't care about the other ones. The other ones can be topped off with precision color inks, even if they remain with you know if they're if they have some remnants of oem ink it will not have a diverse reaction okay this one will okay diverse no you know what i mean a bad reaction when you use it till it's empty this is what it'll look like okay you can clearly see the upper and lower parts of that sponge that that rectangle of fibrous material okay so that's what it'll look like. I can see air in it right now. This cartridge has been laying around for ages. It's probably very dry. I'm going to probably end up flushing it, of course. But now what you need to do is remove that factory fill ball, which is located right here. What do you use to remove that ball? I use a scalpel, but a number 11, um, this is number 11 scalpel. I use a scalpel or I use an exacto knife. You're going to go around. You can clearly see the indentation of that circular little space. You're going to go around and cut the label. You're going to remove that label. When you buy the kit, you will be given a little eye screw. And an eye screw is what you do to hang a big picture frame on the wall. Two eye screws and braided wire. That's what they're used for. The good thing about them is that they have a really sharp little skinny screw shaft. You're going to insert that into the ball. Okay, and you're going to screw, screw, screw until you got a good, good catch of that ball. In other words, you'll be able to then tilt that eye screw back and just pop that ball just like that. Okay, it'll come right out. Now you have a problem. You have a very nicely molded factory cylindrical hole that has a round or spherical base on it with a very tiny hole. You cannot stick a plug in there. You cannot stick any of these plugs in there. You see these plugs? You cannot stick those plugs in there because that seat prevents you from entering. We'll talk about something else that someone someone brought up well, but you know, you can get this. We'll, we'll hit on that in a minute. 
So what you need to do is get a five thirty seconds of an inch, and I don't know what that would be in millimeters. Don't even ask. I have no clue. Five thirty seconds of an inch drill bit. And on a mandrel or whatever you have, put this on a, on a vise, if you have a vise, and proceed to drill out that seat, okay? Don't worry about any chips falling in there. Helix will pull them out rather than push them in, okay, as you're drilling. And again, it's just very gentle. You just got to take off a little tiny amount of plastic anyway. And then you remove that, okay? You are done. You have now modified your cartridge. So now comes what? Now comes flushing. You're going to need, you can actually reset it now if you wish. So this is your CLI 42 resetter from Red Setter. They're the only ones that make a working and reliable resetting system for the CLI 42 chips. You're going to plug that into your USB source. Right here is a plug. Plug it into power. Without this bottom part, of course, you're going to slide it in. Make sure that your chip comes into contact with the bottom here with the resetter's contacts. You will get a red flash. It will go out and then a steady red light. When that happens, you wait about five seconds. That chip is now reset to full. The ID code number is still the same, but it will be reset to full. Okay, so that's all you have to do. Now you're ready to go ahead and flush this cartridge. Windex is what you need. Windex with ammonia D. Go to your supermarket. If you're in the USA, you know what I'm talking about. Get it, get a half gallon of it if you wish, because you're going to be doing this quite often. And it's a great cleaning product for anything that has ink on it. Fill it up with Windex. You need a a basically one of these uh, what do you call it? The um, plain tip syringes. And so here we have a cartridge. Let's, let's just make believe it's not it's not yet flushed, okay? Make believe it's full of ink, okay? You need to clean this now. So you're going to remove that plug that you just created an opening for. Insert it in there. It's a perfect seal. This makes a perfect seal. And pump that Windex. Pump as much as you can, okay? 10, 20 times. You will end up, instead of having this very really difficult to remove yellow it is it's extremely difficult to remove with just plain water never add water at first only windex in the beginning of the flushing process windex only not water remember that if you add water you screwed up okay windex only and flush 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 until you just have the color of windex in that sponge not green because the blue of the Windex plus yellow will make green. So you want to have only the color of the Windex in that sponge. Put the plug back in. Put a bottom cap if you have. Buy these from Precision Colors or from Rick Johnson on eBay. I got a link on my descriptions. We'll talk about that in a bit. Pop this in like so. Snap it in place. You heard that click? That click. This is securely attached now. Let it sit for an hour. Go watch a movie. Come back and begin that same process again, but this time you just water, only water, and not hot water, not super cold water, just you know, lukewarm water, as much as it'll take to remove all of the blue, and you will end up with a pristine white sponge. Now comes the drying process. This is why you can't do this while your printer is waiting for a cartridge. You better have a cartridge available to fill that empty void, okay? That that slot that you created, that's empty now because you removed that cartridge, put another cartridge in there. You better have two sets of cartridges, okay? This is imperative. But I will give you what you need to do to avoid all of this without any kind of problem, okay? But let's go through the process because this is the only one you're gonna flush, the yellow cartridge. The other ones you can just immediately refill with PC inks and pop them back into the printer. Flush, flush, flush. Now it's nice and white and clean. Now you gotta remove all the water. Well, I came up with a gizmo. Buy these clips. Okay, if, you, if you're good with your hands and, and using tools, if you have a Dremel tool, get a find a buddy that has a Dremel tool. Find a little drill that has the same diameter as one of these needles. Okay, whatever the gauge happens to be. It could be 20, it could be 18, whatever. 
and drill a hole all the way through that. I'll show you what that looks like. See, this is silicone. See with a little opening in the middle? So drill a hole through that so that it comes out the other end. With a cutting wheel, cut most of the needle off so you only have about an eighth of an inch worth of needle. Insert it in place and just glue the living daylights out with gel, um, cyanoacrylate glue or crazy glue. I know Gorilla makes it and many other brands of so-called crazy glue, cyanoacrylate, CA, and then let it dry. This is now stuck forever. Here's the thing. How are we going to get that water out of there, that flushing water? It'll take weeks to dry by itself passively. Okay, weeks. You don't have that kind of time. So once you make a little tool like this, and I wish I had mass production techniques to be able to produce this for you guys, but I do not. I'm just telling you exactly what I did. Suck the water out. Squirt. And do it forcibly like that. Suck that water out as much as you can. Get it as light as you can possibly get it as far as weight goes. Once you get it, so that there's really not much water. In other words, you cannot suck out a drop of water. Then you can air dry it. And what I do is I have a, a um, oven, a um, toaster oven that is just beyond help. And I have it set at 100 degrees. And I just proceed. I put a bunch of cartridges in there on a tray with some paper towels. And I run it through cycles of 30 minutes each. And then I weigh each cart. Again, 100 degrees. It's just a hot summer day, except dry. And after a while, you will begin to reduce the weight, get it down to 13.6 grams, and now you are ready. You take your good clip, attach it, boom. Remember, you already reset it. Now it comes refilling. You remove your plug, boom, remove your plug. And you have two choices. A syringe from a bottle and you have to do this and you know pop you know run the ink in or the best way is to take that ink you buy you can probably get it directly into a bottle like this this has got a very stiff wall these are very squeezy okay and so you're just gonna do this okay very clean. Nothing to clean afterwards. Whereas syringes, yeah, you got to go to the sink and wash everything okay, before you use them. Use them again. You don't have to do that with a bottle, squeezy bottle. That's what I use. That's what I do. Nothing else. I have not used a syringe in God knows when. So you fill it to the very near top, near top. Not as much as this OEM. They do that with a machine, okay, so it's safe. You're doing this manually. And again, keep in mind, okay, this is important. Keep in mind, you're not supposed to do any of this. Okay, we figured out a way to do that safely and allow you to still have great results printing, okay? So in, in effect, it's just a total hack, okay? So fill it to the very near top, and then you will immediately see, because at the bottom, let me show you. At the bottom here at the very bottom of that liquid chamber there's a little entry port and that port immediately connects with the sponge the lower part of the sponge you need to have the plug the clip in place otherwise ink will immediately start coming out because you have this open let it let it migrate into the sponge you will see maybe a couple of little pockets of air maybe don't worry about it it's fine the lower part of the sponge is what needs to be you know saturated this level will drop drastically. Keep topping it off slowly. Do not ever overflow, okay? Keep topping it off, let it rest. And at some point, it just won't fill anymore. It will not migrate anymore. Top it off to an eighth of an inch from the top. People say 80%, but what really is 80%? You know, just an eighth of an inch. Plug it. And here's the next test you have to do because you want this cartridge to operate reliably. Oh, another thing. Put this on hold a minute, okay? So there is a source of tapered plugs. These are straight wall. These tapered plugs are supposed to be able to fit 
without having to drill out the seed? Well, uh, no, don't use those, okay? I hate it. I hate to say it, but, you know, he's a good friend, but don't use those. You have a situation with a tapered wall, okay, using a tapered plug. How well do you think that plug will stay in? When it gets a little bit wet with ink, slippery, slippery ink, it'll slide right back out. There's no way it's going to stay put. Why is that important? Well, let me give you the answer. When you remove that seat, that hole is narrower than this plug is, okay, the diameter. So when you insert it, you are actually compressing the plug. When you get past that bottom seat you drilled out, because your 5 32nds is not going to enlarge the primary hole at all. It's only going to drill out the seat. So you end up with it. Let me make it really big so you can see what I'm talking about. You end up with a hole that, a factory hole that's not going to be touched, say it's this wide. And then at the bottom, this, this spherical seat was about that much with a tiny little hole in the middle. All you're doing is enlarging that hole and you still have a bit of a wall there on that seat at the very bottom. This is probably a bit over 5 30 seconds. This will be 5 30 seconds. Okay, so you got wider and a little narrower. This plug will be forced through that little narrow bottom part. It will compress. It will emerge below that. And guess what it does? It relaxes. It gets bigger. Perfect seal. You might be asking, what the hell are you talking about, Jose? Why is sealing so important? Here's why. If you insert this plug in there, and I can just, I can see it coming out of the bottom right now. And you take this out and you put it in your printer. And this is not really sealing. All of the ink will immediately leak out. Within a few minutes, this cartridge will be empty again. Well, that's not what we want, is there? And you think you have ink because the chip will still, is charged to full. The chip has been reset. The chip has no clue what you just did. Okay? So that's why it's, it's, it's so important. And this is how you test your seal. You've gone through the process. You perform all of your actions. Now it is full of ink. Your sponge is saturated. You remove the lower clip and you hold it. I've said this before. Let's use my beautiful mug here. Of course, I would never do that, but you know, you hold it over a mug, a piece of, you know, a can, whatever, and you wait and nothing drips. That's good. You have a seal. That's what you want. You don't want a single drip. Now you're going to test ink flow because the printer expects to have optimal ink flow. You need ink to keep the printhead cool as it prints because it generates heat as it prints. Okay, so you want the printhead to be maintained at the proper operating temperature, which is set at the factory. This will cause no damage to the nozzles. Any higher than that, you will begin to cause damage to the nozzles, period. So ink is a coolant. Okay, as ink is passing through those passages where those explosions are taking place, it's cooling down the process without that cooling it's like a water pump in a car if the water pump is not pumping liquid liquid coolant continually okay you're going to overheat your engine depending on the amount of stress you put it through so a very saturated full of stress image will stress the heck out of the printhead will overheat it and it will fail on you it will literally die okay so you need to have enough ink flow okay that will that will keep your operating temperature at nominal temperatures and you won't have any damage. So you take this off, you hold it over that cup, drip, 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 and drip, and drip. It should be dripping continually, okay? Well, before you waste all of your ink, go ahead and plug it back up. And within a drip or two, it will stop dripping again. Okay, now what you do, is put this clip back on it. These are all third-party clips available both through Precision Colors and Rick Johnson. Take the plug back out, take your bottle, and replenish what you just used during your test. Perform this 
every once in a while as you refill, okay? I haven't done it in a long time, but I haven't suffered from any ink starvation because I know what I'm doing at this point. I've done it so many times already. So that is it, okay? That is it in a nutshell. Now, third-party refillable cartridges for Epson. Remember, don't use refillable cartridges, third-party types for cannons. Always use OEM cartridges. For Epson, that's, a, that's another animal, if you will. Epson uses a cold firing printhead. They don't care. Okay, it's fine. You can use third-party choices like these. And this is for the R3000. So again, on your Canon printers, yeah, that's when you have to be careful and do everything correctly. Now, uh, do I have a Pro 10 cartridge here with me? Probably not. The Pro 10 is even easier. You don't have to do a thing. Nothing. Oh, Pro 100 cartridges, as you change them from now on, the minute one of them goes low, take it out, reset it with a clip, of course, afterwards, and then top it off. Okay, and you can pop it back into your printer. By doing it that way, as soon as it reaches low or before that, the sponge never really loses any more ink because you just lost your replenishing ink already. You see what I'm saying? So once you lose the ability to replenish that sponge and keep it always saturated, it's going to lose ink at that point. There's nothing to replenish it. So do it before that, okay? Take it out, reset it real quick, put a clip and top it off. Remove the clip, put it back in your printer. You're good to go. Pro 10 is different. The Pro 10 has an ink bag inside, an ink bag that's like a little accordion. And that ink bag is actually regulated by a pressure spring it's really amazing the engineering that went on there so those can be allowed to go empty okay there's no sponge the reason you want to do this is because of that sponge you don't want the sponge to be full of air this is full of air if i refill this the air the ink will never enter the sponge there's not enough force to to push that air out so you have to flush it but with a pro 10 cartridge cli 72 i mean pgi 72 you can let them go empty and then just top them off simply upside down dribble ink right on the exit sponge there is an exit sponge dribble ink and the bag will immediately accept the ink drill it dribble it until you get a little flood squeeze it blot it and you're ready to go if you weigh it it'll be about 32 grams total weight simple reset and refill no modifications required Somebody told me, do a video on that. Why should I? It's just really nothing to it. I've done videos on it already. It's so simple. It's the best printer for refilling, folks. Okay, the Pro 10, the easiest printer for refilling. If you want ease of refilling, don't get a Pro 100. Get a Pro 10. Pay more money up front. But you got pigment inks, which will last longer anyway. So, now, how to avoid all of this? rick johnson on ebay okay i have a link on my descriptions and i get nothing from that not a penny i've told him i don't want any kind of recompensation from anything i will give you as much publicity as i can possibly give you but i don't want anything in return so get his cartridge set already pre-modified with the best plugs again you have two choices and i'm going to take you to his site in a minute you have the little white plugs and then the color coded plugs with a little tab that helps you in removal of that plug when you need to refill the other ones kind of require that you have good nails let's just say so let's jump over to the site now for 60 bucks you simply get the best deal in town because really at this point you don't have to do any of this and that's the whole point that i'm trying to make so this is a site on ebay Again, I have a link on my descriptions. People are always asking me, hey, where people look at my descriptions. It's all there. I put a lot of links in there for you guys to be able to take advantage of some of these things. $62. Okay, went up $2. Full set of OEM cartridges already modified with the tab type plugs. And I believe they also include the clips. Yep, there they are, which are these right here. You can buy these separately, 
You can buy these for certain other sizes as well. CLI 8s are identical in size and shape as the CLI 42s. So you can get, you know, CLI 40, uh, you can get CLI 8s and flush those if you want to do that yourself and then transfer chips to them. And that, that'll work as well. But, you know, why? Why not use your CLI 42s and you don't have to transfer anything? Uh, here are the uh, loose plugs, the color-coded ones and the black ones here. Um, what do we have here? Another set of uh, cartridges as well. White plugs. And he also sells to you a um, flushed and drilled yellow cartridge all ready to go. And then one with the, the same thing, but with a clip all ready to go as well. And there's a lot of other products. He's got the original clips, which are like these here. I mean, I and I still keep them because they do have a, a, a use. These right here, these are the originals. You actually break off the bottom of the cartridge as you unwrap it before you install it. Yeah, go ahead and keep those. Now, in order to reuse these, you simply just, you know, hold them in place, a couple of rubber bands, and it keeps it sealed in position. And that will allow you to reuse these cartridges if you do not have any of these much better third-party um, replacements. So that is it right there, the whole site and everything that they offer. So go ahead and take advantage of that. That'll save you a ton of time and effort. I wasn't showing you guys. Oh, wrong. Okay, so here it is. Yeah, one more look-see, and there you go. All right. Again, like I said, I have a link right on my description for this. So we'll go ahead and delete that one. Somebody asked a really interesting question, and something that I, I, I actually was wondering about myself. What is a term ICM? Canon uses ICM. Their profiles are labeled. They are actually tagged as dot ICM. What the heck is that? We use ICC, right? Let's look at this. I keep doing that. Let's look at this. So let me see if I can enlarge this so you can see it better. What is the difference between ICC and ICM? ICC equals International Color Consortium, which is the body that created the standard for device profiling and also the name of the standard itself. Profiles typically carry the ICC file extension on a Windows system. ICM is Image Color Management, which is the color management module in Microsoft Windows operating system. See, while the two terms are sometimes used interchangeably, they really should not be. Some profiling software will make profiles with ICM file extensions. Should this be the case and the profile not be recognized by an application, simply changing the file extension to ICC can solve the problem. So I believe what they're saying is that other than just being the file extension, the information within that profile you created is still identical. Okay, there's no, there's no change. You know, it's not going to render that profile unusable simply by going from ICM and then changing it to ICC. It's going to tell you, are you sure you want to do this? Yeah. So I just noticed that Canon tends to use ICM as the file extension on their profile. But again, it was an interesting question that I did not know the answer to. So I Google immediately. Google is your friend. The person who asked should have just Googled it. I don't understand why people just don't immediately just spend a little time searching. Ooh, searching. Play, playlists especially, those are important. Check the descriptions of the videos. There's links. Take you to different places that you may already be asking about, but you just didn't take the time to search. Oh, yeah. So Windows um, system apparently, you know, it's a little, I don't know about Mac. I don't know how Mac handles that, but I know Windows will accept both. And when you create something with a color monkey, I don't know. I got to go back and look now what profile extension they use. Anyway, so that is it about that subject. Let me see what else. Oh, let's talk about 
I just did a video. I think it's up already. Um, people wonder, and the question arose because somebody was really freaking out. Well, first of all, oh gosh, we have a super chat that I ignored. I'm, I apologize for that. For that, Jason Machen or Macken, um, five dollar super chat. Really, thank you so much, my friend. Appreciate that tremendously. Uh, let's see anything else. And then we'll get to this. Oh, so we're going to talk about piezography. Don't let me forget this. Do not let me forget. Uh, let's see. Charles Verbruggen wants to know if I had experience printing canvas. What are the things that you should pay attention to? Well, canvas is just a little bit more difficult to load. Other than that, you treat it exactly the same. You, you're going to use a ICC profile made for that canvas. Okay, if it's made for OEM, you better use OEM. Uh, making profiles on Canvas is a little bit difficult. I don't know how they do it. I have problems with my instruments reading over that texture that the Canvas has. So, lucky for me, even on the Pro 100, uh, using the PC's SE inks, since they basically act just like OEM as far as color rendition, I can use their own ICC profiles for whatever canvas I want to print on. Now, canvases with a sheen, some kind of gloss, uh, who makes that? Uh, Breathing Color has it. Uh, I think Hannah Mill has one as well that has a gloss. Pro 100 will eat that up. It's wonderful. The only problem is 13 by 19 is the max you can make, or maybe 13 by 25 if you create a, uh, you know, a custom size. And uh, yeah, but it, it'll just work beautifully with those dye inks. Matte canvas, not so good. You need uh, pigment inks with matte black. Art is here. He says, better late than never from West Tennessee. Richard Rajewski from Los Angeles area purchase. I'm now waiting for my new Canon Pixma Pro 100 to arrive. Well, great. Make sure you watch my set of video. Okay, look at the Pro 100 um, playlist and look it up. It should be probably the very first video I did on that series. So look at that and uh, it's like an hour long, but I walk you through everything you need to know. The goal is that you do not mess up. Okay, and you are immediately printing great prints with that Pro 100. Okay, which is capable of doing. Absolutely. Nick Santoleri. I must go for today. Thank you. Uh, thank you for all your great advice. Well, thank you, Nick. And again, I appreciate uh, having spoken with you on the phone. Rick Johnson, checking in. All right, Rick. So we've been talking about your uh, um, goods that you have on your site. I already showed them your actual site and all of the items that you currently have. And of course, I'm sending everyone out to you. I hope you run out of carts really quick. That's my goal to have you have you um, sell out. Jeff Thompson from South Louisiana, Red Solaris one. Jose, any experience mixing PC inks with for Pro Set with Pro Ten with OEM inks? Absolutely none, no problem at all. Uh, the current signature edition uses uh, OEM Red. Be aware of that, and the other colors will react perfectly fine. But again, you have no problem because you're going to run those cartridges empty, okay? Don't don't fill up a cartridge with half full OEM. Just use it till it's empty. Fill it up. It takes about two minutes to perform the operation, really. Reset, dribble, dribble until it's full. Pop it back into the printer. You're done. That's it. Art Yum Andrew. Art Artie Yum. Artie Yum. And Andrev. Andrev. I don't know. <laughs> Jose, I live in Norway, and therefore PC inks are not an option. Okay, Octo Ink, as you mentioned, uh, that's a that's a good uh, and yeah, they claim. Okay, they claim that their yellow ink does not react. I know Martin. Okay, I know Martin personally. They say that the ink does not react. I would not take a chance. Okay, that's just my 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 um, recommendation, if you will. Why would you take a chance? 
Okay, just flush it. Um, Ted Ted from New Jersey is here as well. Okay. But yeah, um, you're, you're in Europe, octoink.co.uk is your source for the best inks for the Pro 100, period. Uh, again, and just take it with a grain of salt whether you believe that the yellow will not react with original OEM yellow. Okay, I would not take that chance. Just my two cents. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about what I did. So the question was, somebody was printing charts for profiles and they were shocked when they saw on their computer because when you use a piece of software that is designed for one of these units such as this okay this is the original color monkey this is the i1 pro 2 i think there's an i1 pro 3 out now uh, but i'm very satisfied with this one so again 1500 bucks Nothing to sneeze at, so I will stick with this one at this point. So, when you use the software to print these charts, you're going to see what the image looks like. Okay, you can choose any number of patches to print, by the way. So, you go ahead and print them, and you print them with no color management. Okay, no color management. But the original image of those patches will not look like what you get on print. Don't be shocked. You're printing with zero color management. It's as if I gave you a symphony to read and perform, but I didn't teach you how to, how to play that instrument. It's going to sound terrible. So what happens is that the printer will not receive the instructions that it requires to only take, say, nine, eight colors, actually, in a nine-color printer or 12 in a, in a Canon Pro 1000. They will not receive the instructions that you need to from those 11 colors, actually, because you have clear chroma optimizer, how to reproduce up to 60 million shades of color. So it just does the best it can. And so that's what you want. You want the printer to just basically print those color patches, whether it's 1,200 or 1,600 or even higher color patches the best way it can simply with just the driver with no help from anybody so no color matching no color management okay of course it's not going to match what you see in the screen that's the whole purpose of producing an icc profile okay you are creating a file whether, whether it's dot icc or dot icm that contains a correction for every single one of those patches you printed, whether it was printed correctly, it sort of matches, and it will be read. It will be read by this accurately. You're not using your eyeballs. You're using an instrument, an un unbiased instrument that's been pre-calibrated, not even, no less. And so it's going to reach each patch, and it's going to say, okay, because the software has told me that it should have been this color, reproduce on that paper but you got something a little bit different in fact it's shifted in this direction this is what you have to do to correct that one color patch so that it matches what you see in your monitor that's one one it has to do it 1600 times so you go through the whole process of reading every one of those color patches and then it will then create a complete set of instructions on how best to reproduce all 1600 of those color patches correctly. So without the ICC profile, they will look wrong. They will look wrong. So this is what it looks like. On paper, this is a job I did for someone. Three charts printed without any color management. In this color, or all of the, the patches look cool to you, they look okay. That's not what they look like when you view them on the monitor. Okay, they are not 100% accurate. Okay, so by scanning each one of these one at a time, as the scanner passes over, it creates a correction. It says, Oh, this is off by this amount. Oh, this is off by this amount. Oh, this one's perfect. 
no re no no correction required you know oh this one is the correct tone but too dark or too light or yeah so many different parameters that it's going to read as either correct or incorrect and it creates a set of instructions that's the profile you then create that profile and you have something that you can then apply when you print a real image okay when you print that real image the same thing will happen that image contains hundreds and hundreds of different shades of color different densities and it will go ahead and create that set of instructions and as the ICC profile looks at every bit of tonality that image had it will tell the driver okay hey here's a tone that you know you're going to have a little bit of trouble with okay so do this adjust it in this manner okay it's amazing so i'm going to show you something relatively graphic here i mean it's going to show you right off the bat i just use semi-gloss from canon this is remember those sales that canon had you know buy one get nine free i got a bunch of this stuff so i printed one of my images that i have on my facebook group for you guys to grab and simply it's just a set of color patches it reminds me of the uh, x-ray color patch uh, color passport so it has colors it has a black and white basically neutral um, ramp and it has a transition color transition um, portion as well okay so this is going to be a little bit difficult to see uh, this kind of cheap video camera but you will be able to see the difference so here is the one that assuming this was an image say one of my private images or someone else's image and i wanted to print it and i wanted to be reproduced correctly i would print it with an icc profile and i would get this so assume assume that this is actually a profile chart but only with a few colors and you can see okay and you might say well that looks pretty good jose yeah because i use an icc profile so that's 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 a really really good rendition of what i saw on the screen so here's what happens when you print with no color management you still say well wait a minute jose that still looks good okay watch this what do you see now you see this green this is what it should be like but you see that that's what it actually printed so a huge correction needs to be made okay during the profile cor uh, profile creation so that when it sees this color this value it doesn't produce this really off looking rendition of it and some of the colors will be slightly more visible as far as the differences go you need to really look at this now look at this right here bingo and bingo and see the difference here and again you might not be able to see this very clearly in this kind of environment but you can see the difference the icm one there is a big difference right here big difference bottom is icm with a profile okay look at that look at this it's a big difference okay you can see it and again so what is happening this one is being printed uncorrected okay as best as the printer can do okay so i wanted to show this to someone so that they could see the difference now let's look at the transition again this is going to be really really difficult to see look at the top one the top one is with with an icc profile the bottom one is without check out this region right here compared to that region right there let me hold it up you see that huge difference so again look at the icm neutral patches and then look at the ones without color management and again this is going to be influenced by the color of the monitor whatever I, I got my control panel here in front of me but again you will see the differences between something printed without any color management and something printed through an icc profile custom made for that paper printer and ink the results will be perfect almost almost perfect with the correct profile applied 
one of the questions that was asked is I, you know, I have a, a Canon printer and I got a ton of Epson paper. Can I use it? Well, sure, you can use it as long as it's a compatible surface. Formulations between, you know, Epson inks and Canon inks may fluctuate slightly. But again, remember that third party papers that you buy from many of the other companies, not Canon, not Epson, you can buy third party papers. Well, guess what? We have about six to seven major paper mills in the country. And they make papers for many different companies, okay? Many different brands. And they may come off the same role, okay? And they just basically rebatch as some other brand, okay? Some other name, some other configuration. So again, you need to find a paper. Somebody, the reason I brought this up is because somebody tried to print, I think it was a Pro 1000 using a Epson paper and they were getting a, a bit of what I believe is what I discussed really early today. Papers that are that are fine art, that coating is so fragile that it causes problems almost when you're printing a very dense area that's going to require a high density of ink. It gets wet, it gets mottled, it gets, you know, it, it begins to uh, lose the dot structure and you get nothing but a mess. Yeah, so that happens. That's not saying that that paper on a properly set up Epson printer would not work. Of course, it's designed for that because it's an Epson paper. They apparently have a lot of it and they wanted to use it on a Canon Pro 1000. No, a baloney, a Canon P Pro 6000. Same thing, just bigger. So they were having problems with that. And I kind of said to them, well, I think it's a paper incompatibility problem. So again, sad if they cannot use that ton of Epson paper they have on hand, that would be sad. But again, you would have to, and I believe they told me that they have ICC profiles that they created themselves for that combination. So it's if you have some weird reaction like that, and it just looks like is there's there's too much ink laid down. Yeah, then you have to adjust because what happens is just because a paper has a semi-lustrous surface and is classified as a burrita paper, one of those um, barium sulfate coated fine art papers that are not going to be RC. They're not going to be resin coated like these. This is plastic. This is plastic. This is plastic. This is not a real high quality rag paper. This is just plain plastic coated paper they dry instantly great i mean for most handling yeah it will it will stand up to your you know mistreating these and nothing will happen to them i could soak that in water the ink will not will not come out so or, or smudge or anything like that or, or even leak so um what happens is that the paper by having a semi-luster paper uh, surface they may tell you to use a matching semi lost or semi semi gloss or, or luster sort of you know choice that may exist in that driver and that choice may ask for a lot more ink density maybe this does maybe it doesn't you don't know that until you try so you may you may have a perfect match for that surface but not a perfect match for the amount of ink or the density of ink that's going to be laid down and you may have problems. Again, it's very tricky. That's why the Pro Series of Canon printers has the ability to create your own media configuration. So I suggested that they do that. Adjust the ink density to the optimal condition, um, you know, plate and thickness, all of that stuff. Everything that they need to do to custom build a, a media configuration that they, they can then load onto the driver and you'll be able to actually see it on your drop down menu you'll see whatever paper that happened to be you give it a name of course everything whatever you want to call it it'll be there and you'll be able to access it and all of the settings that you went through painstakingly during that media configuration process will be then applied reduce ink density if that's what it needs to do or increased ink density if that's what it needs to do the thickness of the platen gap 
all of that stuff will be taken into consideration, whether you have to load from the top feeder or the manual feeder in the back. All of that. All of that will be immediately automatically triggered. Yeah. So that was that was kind of interesting. Now, a friend of mine just sent me this Christmas. He made some labels for me, address labels, and he sent me this little card. You see that? Except watch this. Glossy in the back as well. Isn't this what everybody wants? I mean, I can I can stick a stamp on this and drop it in the mail. Done on the P800, by the way. So what paper is this, Jose? Well, this is Red River. Uh, what is it? Oh, gosh. Oh, my God, I forgot. Uh, Pecos. Dual gloss. Pecos. Pecos. Uh, River, is it? Something like that. Dual gloss. And this is one of the really old and often neglected, neglected papers that Red River has available. Dual coated gloss paper. Heavy, nice, nice heavy uh, postcard type paper. Again, and I think he made a template and uh, great work. And it works. I mean, it works. And so I'm going to look into this because, heck, I want to make some cards too. Why not? You know, why not? So Pecos, let me look it up because I, now I'm curious, guys. Now I'm curious. Make sure that I lead you in the right direction. For those of you who want to do note cards, now this is not this is not their their um, pre scored cardstock, not that. Let me see if I have. I used to have a link to that before. Anyway, I will look it up. Red River Papers. Red River Papers. Okie dokie, here we go. All right, let's go ahead and switch over. Gosh, I keep doing that. Red River Papers. So shop by any size. Paper type. Let's go and try paper type. We got glossy, glossy papers. Boom. And do du double size glossy, and here we go. Pecos River gloss. There we go. That's what it is. And you can get it in many different weights. So the thicker you, you know, the paper, the uh, more difficult it may be to uh, be able to print using your regular um, feeder. So here's the dual. The Duo double-sided glossy paper, Pecos River Gloss Duo, 86 pound. Let's see how much they want for that stuff. Which is the uh, button, the bottom button right here. Okay. So it's at 320 grams and 15 mil printable on both sides. Bright, bold, bright white and glossy. What do they want for this? 54 by 6 for 16 bucks, 17 bucks. Not bad. So here's the thing. Here's what you need to do. When you go ahead and print with that type of material, use a good printer, of course. You know, you got to use something like the P100, Pro 10, you know, Pro 100. Any of those nice printers will work beautifully. Um, print one side and wait until it is fully, fully dry because you may end up with roller marks, okay? So what I would do, the most important part is this side. I would print the back first, okay? And then go ahead and print the other side once it is dry. And again, you could knock out 50 of these in a matter of uh, one morning. And so they, you know, um, they've given us the uh, ability to do this relatively easy at home with just a commonly available printer. Pretty awesome. Okie dokie. So, again, that was one of the questions. That was one of the questions that was being asked about me uh, by uh, someone about, you know, using um, Epson papers on a Canon printer specifically. And um, the same thing could occur the other way. Epson printer using Canon papers. 
you just got to try and then use the commonly available because no one's going to make ICC profiles. Really, they're not going to make ICC profiles for you unless you pay. So you're not going to find them. You're not going to find on the Canon side ICC profiles for Epson papers. Are you kidding me? Of course not. And vice versa. It's not going to happen. So you need to make them yourself and then you need to adjust your ink densities accordingly. Now, someone also asked me this. They wanted to know where the heck is the saturation adjuster or slider in a Canon printer? And I thought, is there even such a thing? Let's take a look. So I guess somebody needed to do a, an increase in contra in saturation. I don't know why they want to do that. Because if you have a properly calibrated system, you should not have to, you know, do that at all. So let's just go ahead and pick the Pro 1000. You know, why not? It's my favorite at this point. Canon printer, that is. So we'll close that up. And let's see. So if we click here, it says color intensity manual adjustment. Hmm. That could be that could be a place where we can look. Let's move it over here. Let me minimize that. Let's move over here a second. And we'll click on that. Okay, what do we have here? So we have cyan, magenta, yellow, brightness, and contrast. And there is no adjustment for saturation. I thought they used to be, but apparently not. So that takes care of that. Okay, I thought there was, but apparently not. At one point, a long time ago, they may have had that option, but apparently not anymore. So let's go ahead and look at another another printer. Let's look at an Epson printer. See if it's available on Epson. So we'll pick the, uh, I don't know, the 3880, an oldie but goodie, 3800. Okay, so how do we find any of this option? User defined, blah, 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 blah. How about here, color and photo enhanced color. Controls advanced. Ah, so here we go. This is all manual stuff. And indeed, you do have a saturation level um, slider. Contrast, brightness. So apparently Canon did away with that, but Epson kept theirs. Isn't that interesting? So now I got to go back and apologize to this person because I thought for sure there was going to be a saturation adjustment on the Canon printers. Apparently not. Hmm. All right, let's see what else we got here. We got a couple of more tabs to go through here. I wanted to share with you something I found about... Um, people of, often ask me, they're in Europe, and I always give them Octo Inc. Because that's in the UK, and they will ship throughout Europe. But what if you're in Germany? If you're in Germany, there's OCP. And OCP is one of the oldest ink companies out there. And I want to show you what they have because it's quite interesting. I used to buy OCP ink all the time for my 3800, my original 3800 that is sitting dead on my floor right now because of a bad motherboard that I could never repair. I could never, even after replacing it, it never worked. It just does not print. It goes through all of the motions except actually laying ink on paper okay it stopped doing that like that one time once one minute it was good the next minute it was not okay so i've given up on it but anyway i used their pigment ink set okay i bought it from a u.s uh, distributor that was uh uh wow what was the name uh ink r jet r jet tech R jet like a jet plane and then TEC rjettech.com. But anyway, they sell OCP inks. And I want to show you what the OCP site looks like. So here we are. Search by inkjet. So you can search by laser, inkjet supplies, uh, inkjet equipment, basically refilling. These people are the suppliers. For all of those kiosks that you may remember seeing, I haven't seen one lately, but back in the days when you used to be able to 
refill just about anything. Excuse me. You would see these uh, kiosks at malls. And I used to be able to take my old. Let me go back. Like Lexmark cartridges and refill those. This is a brand new one. I use this on my um, disc printing uh, printer, by the way. But anyway, you used to be able to refill these at the mall for you. So they're the ones that provided them with all of those dye inks and the actual machines that do the process. And uh, But anyway, they have just about everything under the sun when it comes to printer type uh, equipment and supplies and tools and that type of thing. So take a, take a look at that if you're interested. Again, I'm not here to promote them, just to kind of let you know. So... You got a liter of black pigment ink. Let's see what that sells for. I think you might be extremely surprised. For an HP 300, you know, big deal. I mean, it doesn't matter. But look at the price. It's like 13 euros, okay? If you buy two, one or two, 13 euros for a liter of ink. I mean, come on. I used to buy ink for my 3800 like i said and it came out to something like three cents three and a half cents per ml that's if i bought it with a on a 16 ounce bottle that is so again ridiculously low price and as long as you're printing on matte media that did not require gloss okay you were fine it was fantastic it was the ink that I used when I was learning how to print on that Canson watercolor paper. I first used the 3800 for that. And that particular matte black ink from OCP was incredibly dense. I think it's as good or better than this high density HD inks that they're being sold now for the Epson, you know, sure color series. I think it was much better than that. What about you want to reset your Epson printers, ink counters? How about the chipless solution? All of this stuff. Twomanuals.com. Let's jump over to that. Okay, so take a look at this as well. I'm going to turn myself off here because I'm blocking some of the um, site. Okay. So you can download the WIC reset utility here. You can buy a reset key. And let's watch a video real quick here. I think it's only like 30 seconds. What it takes to reset, for instance, an Epson L220. Okay, let's go ahead and, re and, and watch that. Isn't that amazing? It actually does take that little amount of time. So basically what you saw being performed was on an Epson printer, and I think they're going to, they might start delving into some Canon printers. I'm not sure. Don't take that to the bank. It's just, I, I thought I saw something way back. Okay, so here's what happens. Internal waste ink pads. Uh, anytime you remove a cartridge, install, install a new cartridge, an ink purge is, you know, generated because they want that cartridge you install, especially if you refilled it, to actually be flowing ink into the printhead. So the only way to make sure it's doing that is to expel some of the ink out of the printhead, and with it, then some of the ink from the cartridge enters the printhead. Now we now we know we are primed. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen to just that one cartridge. It happens to all of the other cartridges as well. There's no way to, to isolate them. So all of that wasted ink, really for naught, goes into the internal waste pads. The counter is ticking higher and higher and higher. Now, some of these printers, you can actually diverge 
that ink waste tubing outside and collect your ink in a bottle such as this. And then when you're done, you dispose of it accordingly. I like to put bleach in it. And once it basically becomes almost like a, like a grayish color down the toilet, then it's safe. You can actually get rid of it because especially dye inks, they're organic, so it'll be fine. So as long as you bleach them out. So what happens is that if you don't divert that ink, then your pads are actually physically becoming soiled. But even if you just don't, at some point, whether you do or you do not is what I should say. At some point, those counters reach a certain level. Boom, the printer stops working. You get an error that says some of the parts on your printer have reached the ends of the end of their lives. So what does that mean? It just means that waste pads are full. There's no way that you can actually read that through your normal driver that does not give you that kind of information. It just says, hey, your printer's done for, take it to a repair shop. What they'll do is they will reset the, the counter to zero. They will dismantle the complete printer, reach below, remove those soil pads, install, clean it out, install clean pads, put the whole printer, everything back into the chassis, and that's it, and you pay a ton of money. Well, if you just simply divert the ink and then use this tool to reset your printer counter back to zero, you've basically kept your waste pads clean. And for just 10 bucks every year or whatever, however long it takes, you are resetting your printer again to basically brand new empty count levels. So what else do they offer? They offer all sorts of things. They offer the ability to do the uh, the uh, chipless solution because you need the wick tool, the wick reset tool to be able to do that. Without it, you cannot perform that installation of that firmware. So you're going to have to buy this, and then you're going to buy the the um, the you're going to download the firmware, and then you're going to buy the reset key for it. That costs you sixty bucks. I I believe that's what it is. And then that will allow you to, for instance, turn your PA-100 into a chipless printer. Basically, it will use the chips. Still, it needs to use the chips to identify the color. Mm. But it will always display a full display of ink. So that's how it works. The, the printer just never receives information that you are actually lowering your ink levels. It just never does. Now, if you look up on YouTube, you will be able to find lots of these types of videos showing you how other printers are reset. Now, what if you need to perform some sort of a work? Well, I believe that they also sell um, so-called um, service manuals. And again, I haven't gone through everything. Here we go. We have most wanted service manuals with excellent live support online download service and here's the list of service manuals this is chipless oh these are the activation keys for all of the printers that they support for chipless use amazing so anyway have a look through this it is simply two manuals.com i will put that link on the chat and you guys can go ahead and enjoy that. You can have a look at it. It has probably stuff that you will not find anywhere, okay, at all. So that's another good source for stuff and information. All right, let's look at this. This is um, this is my latest. Gosh, I keep doing that. I'm not saying goodbye yet. This is my latest batch of videos right here, okay. So this is what I was telling you guys. And I'm going to show you. This is this is on my side. This is not what you guys get to see. So I'm going to just click on it and arrive at my, my links. Here's my description. Again, Canon cleaning cycles. Why again? Yeah, we're going to discuss that. Yeah, we already did. Why are we discussing this again? Uh, people are not getting it. But look, below that, immediately below that is all of my links. And this is what I get 
asked daily, what about this? Do you have a link for this? Just look here. It's all right here. Okay. Lots of li different links and what the links are for, what they will lead you to. So let me, let me show it so you can actually see it. Oh, big dummy. Here we go. Now you can see it. So here is the video page where I was at. And again, oh, but do you have this on all your videos? Yeah, all my latest videos will have this series of links. There we go. They're all right there. Okay. You want to look at my merch? You want to look at my channel? Give somebody my channel link right there. You want to join Patreon? You want to donate by PayPal? You want to go to my affiliate page at Amazon? There it is. Facebook private group link. My products website right here. Custom paper profiles. You need some profiles made. Here's the link for that. And here's Rick Johnson's um, link for his store on eBay for, you know, what we discussed earlier, all those cartridges and, and clips and plugs and you name it. QImage1. If you're a Mac user and you want to use QImage, this is now QImage1. is for Mac. They also have it for Windows. This is a, a watered-down version of, U, of QImage Ultimate. How about if you want to refill your cartridges from Canon, but you need cheaper priced inks that are OEM, 700 ml cartridges for the Pro 1000 refilling, as well as the Pro 2000, but they are you actually used for the Pro 2000 and up. So these are actual OEM cartridges that will fit the Pro 2000 and up, but I use their inks to refill my Pro 1000, okay? $225 with free shipping to the United States. Pro 100, cleaning cycles. Hey, here's an article on that. Take a look at that. Epson OEM HDR inks in bulk. Yes. If you want to refill some of your PA100s with correct HDR inks, this is the link right here. There's a promo code that you can use. Anyway, so it's all there. All you got to do is just take the time to look, okay? If you don't look, you will not see it, and you will be asking me again about all of this stuff that's already available for you. I've made it available for you. All right, let's take a very, very quick look at Facebook and see what is new on the horizon there. All right, so we're going to remove this. We don't need it anymore. And this is uh, my latest video, refilling needs, what you need to um, get in order to properly refill your Pro 100s. And we already demonstrated that live here with you guys. So I'm going I'm to leave that on top. Now, here is what someone was asking about, piezography. So piezography... Let me look at the Inkjet Mall site and I'll show you. Hope I typed that in correctly. Cone Color Pro. Okay, so this is it. So we're going to go ahead and do the piezography right here. Okay. They really go deep into this because they're the ones that created this process. So if you're interested, everything is right here, okay? Inkjet, inkjet, inkjetmall.com, okay? But what is it? What is it? Basically, it's this. Let me put my little head right here. You can still see me right here in the corner. So... It's taking an Epson printer, and it has to be an Epson printer because they don't make any other type of ink, okay? So it's formulated for Epson. So basically, they concentrate on Epson K3 printers, meaning you have two blacks, magenta, oh, magenta, two blacks, matte black, and photo black, and then two grays. That's your K3. So they have done away with the color inks and replaced each color with a specific shade of gray, whether it's deep all the way to a lighter shade. Here's the catch. In order for you to be able to do this correctly, you will not be able to use the driver any longer. You will be able to have um, 
you know, you have to use a rip. And a rip with, that they are recommending is quad tone rip. Quad as in a quad, as in four. Quad tone rip. So basically, that's what you will use. It will have all kinds of pre-designed curves. And what that means is that we will be able to then take what should have been yellow and assign a specific shade of gray to that. Your results are amazing. So what you can choose from is their neutral set of inks. So they're perfectly neutral. You won't have any problems any longer with, oh, my prints are a little bit greenish. My monochromes are a little bit magenta-ish. No, when you, when you fill up those refillable cartridges with the neutral black inks, PSO inks, you will get perfectly neutral prints. Now, you could also buy the warm PSO inks or the cool PSO inks. And what do you need? Well, you need to dedicate a printer. And the 3880 is what he's using. And again, I think over here he's comparing uh, the same images done on the Pro 1000 using black and white mode. So anyway, that's really interesting. So again, remember, you are going to need an Epson printer. You're going to need an Epson printer that has the ability to be used with a third-party product. So if you want to sacrifice your, not sacrifice because you can go back, but if you want to use your P800, and the problem is, of course, you can only use refillable cartridges just, just one time until the first one goes empty and the chip is no longer recognized. Yeah, you have to switch over to some other system like the chipless solution. Keep those refillable carts in place, load it with PSO Flush. That printer will be only for black and white now, okay? Forever, if you choose to keep it that way. And uh, the inks are great. I've used them before. They are not going to clog your printer. They're, they're, they're configured the same way as original Epson inks are microencapsulated. Again, like I said, if you buy the warms, the warm set, you will get consistently slightly warm. I'm not talking about sepia tone. I'm talking about slightly warm and slightly cool or perfectly dead on neutral. It's not cheap and you do have to dedicate a printer. So in the case of me, I got a couple of Epson 3880 or 3800 that I could be using for that. I got an R3000 that I could be using for that easily. Okay. All I got to do is provide refillable cartridges and just load them with those inks. And then learn how to use the RIP software to be able to print your prints. And there's a lot of information about that. And they run workshops. I think they're up in Vermont. So they run these workshops that are strictly for piezography, black and white printing, all of this stuff. They do all sorts of things. Mm. They were the pioneers that came up with this system. So they sort of own it. And this is right now, I think, right on the very top uh, news on my, uh, on my group, my Facebook group. So I know there was one person that was interested in that. Go ahead and take a look at that. I did my welcoming, and again, we have, let me take a quick look here. We are up to 35, 25 members. That's pretty good. That is pretty good. And we already got nine new members already. All right, this is an interesting question, and I, I'll probably deal with this as see we'll go until seven o'clock tonight and um, that should be plenty i got about another how many more tabs do i got to go to a couple more tabs so here's the catch and this is something that that is applicable also on your um whether it's epson or canon and i don't care if, what what software you're printing with so the guy says um this is eric johnson he says Okay, guys, I downloaded a QImage tryout version. I want to make a paper size of 8 by 19. I made a preset page, meaning he made a preset or a manual custom paper size. It says print will be put on two pages. What am I doing? What am I not doing to get the 8 
by 19 file to fit onto an 8 by 19 paper size. Here's the thing. See, you would think, let me go back to me. Oh, and Mike Cheney answered this one, okay? So there you go. But here's the catch. Here's the thing that you need to learn and, 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 and well, accept. If I make, I don't care what size it is, custom size, as long as I'm, my printer can handle it. Let's just say, let's just assume that 13 by 19 would be a custom size. In this case, is what was it? 8 by 19. Let's just pick that. 8 by 19. And then it creates an image that's also 8 by 19. Guess what happened? It won't fit. What do you mean it won't fit? Of course it'll fit. No, it will not fit. Because your printable space is smaller. It's smaller. It's smaller by the minimal margin that you have to have, period. It is etched in stone. I don't care if you use Canon or Epson printers. There's always going to be a minimum margin, and it's not equal either. You've seen this before on Lightroom, right? It's not equal either. So if you create a specific size image, 13 by 19, you don't have 13 by 19 amount of space to work with. Okay, You have a page that is 13 by 19 or 9 by 19 in this case, but you don't have 9 by 19 worth of space to play in. You do not, okay? Let me show you really, really quick what happens. And again, this is a, a total newbie, um, you know, thing that occurs. Let's go ahead and choose Q image. Why not? Since that's what is being used here. So Q image. The latest version, 2020-110. Let's make ourselves. Let me see what. Let's see what what printer he was using. He didn't say. Oh, Pro 100. Okay. So we'll pick the Pro 100. We'll set that up. And like that, and we will make ourselves a custom paper size. Now, if I don't do this correctly, and, and Mike Cheney is still here, he will he will take care of me. Nine by, no, eight. It was eight. And it really doesn't matter what size I pick, actually, by 19. Okay. And boom, and boom. So now we have eight by 19. Kind of a nice panel, right? We're in poster mode, so let's go ahead and uh, let me see if I remember how to do this. No, that's not it. Here we go. So we'll just do a center. Okay. Now, notice that I actually do not have 8 by 19. See what it says right there? Page size. In other words, the workable page size that you have because of those enforced non-printable borders gives me 7.731 by 18.685 inches worth of space. I don't have 8 by 19. So if I load an 8 by 19 image, it's going to say that it needs another page to finish printing it because it's going to print par partially that 8 by 19 into this space and whatever's left over is going to be printed on another sheet. That's how it is. Oh, what am I doing? I'm not showing you this stuff again. Ah, okay. I need a director here to help me. Okay, so we're in key image. I set up an 8 by 19 page size. There it is. But look right here. 5. That's how much actual working space I have. So whatever image I lay on there is not going to print. Especially if I create if I create a specific image that's 8 by 19, 300 ppi, and I drop it in here, it's not going to fit. Okay? Partially, it's going to be printed here, and then whatever's left over onto a secondary sheet of 8 by 19. So what it needs to do, since this cannot be made into custom, 
it, this cannot be made into um, borderless. Okay, so we can get rid of those margins. This is an odd paper size. You cannot print borderless to that. Then you're stuck. So what you need to do is fit that image. Okay, just fit it. And we're going to go here. Let me see here. Oh, it won't even fit. See that? It's still going to force it into that. You see what I'm saying? So, no, you cannot do that. So, even if I had the proper size image, there's no way that I can, you know, fit it there because I have less room to work with than the size of the image. And this is what that poor guy is not really getting. And, again, it's not an error. This is the way printers work. There's no way of getting around that. You have a, a page size and the actual image size. And so in order for him to be able to do that, you could not possibly create an image that would be, say, you know, eight eight by 19. It would have to be like eight, like seven and a half by 17 and a half. That would fit. Or no, eight and a, seven and a half by 18 and a half. And that would fit. Okay. So again, in QImage, you can make a cell and that'll fit as well. That would be the best way to do that. All right, let's see what else we got. Oh, people are asking me for files. Well, they're here. Just go to my Facebook group. Let's go ahead and start from the top. So we got two new people here. Let's give them approval right here on the fly so there you go they're they're just coming on like like there's no tomorrow i love it join this group okay so you're here you landed here and you want to file here it is files boom and i finally uploaded all of the individual files that work inside this big test image dot rar and no one with a mac can open a dot rar i believe so i decided to load the files enclosed in that rar windows can but i don't think apple can uh right here individually so you just go ahead and download uh a pdi test image now what else, what do these look like let me show you what they look like let me take you over to my and i think i showed you last week what those look like but in case you haven't seen them they're really neat and really useful images. If I could find it. Test image. Come on, guys. Let me type in test. Here we go. So here are the images. Let me make this big. We'll put some big icons here. I have the folder here. And again, they just include all of these so this is the one that i showed you earlier this is this one right here you see that that's the one i use for this little test and it's a great one because it gives you the basic colors that you need and one of these nice nice uh transition charts here that you can check your printer's ability to print really smooth transitions now what we have here this is a, a um, gamma test and it's going to test the ability again of your printer to be able to print the most saturated red magenta cyan yellow green and blue okay and also black and whether it can do it from from saturation to white or from saturation to black and then here's again a set of transitions here's another set and then some regular images that you can go ahead and look and see how well the printer is producing these and then here's one of the test images here's a uh, another one it's a um, basically a good one for testing ink starvation if you're refilling and you want to test your printer whether it is providing enough ink you'll see that here okay because it'll stop it will fail when it tries to print these very strong colors here here's the standard we all use right here here's another one and one of the many types of um, test charts that are available and then this one's really good if you're going to print only black and white okay so you just you know you're not going to ever print color this is the chart that you should be using 
right here. Okie doke, that's about it for that. And again, all available for free. You don't have to search. These are all free images, but you would have to search high and low to try to find them. So I make this available for you guys so that you don't have to do that. Just directly go to my site and uh, download them. Uh, let's see what's available here for questions on the comment section of the uh, YouTube. And also, hey, got any questions? Post them right now because we got about 45 more minutes before we say bye-bye for the week. So go ahead and post them. And if I need to go over time, that's no problem. I'll do that. So I just bought a Pro 2000. Okay, that's what this person says. I replaced a Z29 2100. That's probably an HP. Unfortunately, when I got the Pro 2000 on Thursday, I started it and got a hardware error on the ink pumps power supply. I am waiting patiently from my tech to come. Oh man, that sucks. Uh, you talked about cleaning cycles. You did not mention how much ink a cleaning cycle uses. That's because we do not know. And it depends. They're always going to be variable, if you will. So I used about four liters of ink a year on my Z2100. It is eight colors. I love the machine, but it no longer supported. Ink prices are rising and costs of fixing the machine and risks of the cost and the cost of Canon machine drove me to a Pro 2000. I have never seen a print on it, so I am flying blind. I print almost exclusively on Canson canvas paper. I need to get this printer going. But regardless, how much ink does a machine use during a cleaning cycle? Again, all I can say is we do not know. Okay. You literally would have to weigh the cartridges before and after. That would be easy to do. Okay. That would be easy to do and it would not require any kind of, um, you know, effort from you. Or, or you can weigh the so-called maintenance cartridge before and after. That would give you kind of a, a total amount of volume. And that's probably what I'm going to tell him. And again, here we go. Uh, okay, Jose, the 60-hour, 120-hour, etc. rule is not set in stone. There are many variables of this. It seems that the printer decides each time when it will be based on... Okay, so what they're saying is that... Remember I told you that if you print a lot the more you print the more residue you build up okay so let's 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 just show you two examples i print one image it runs a clean cycle in 60 hours the next image i don't print anything for 60 hours the next image beyond 60 hours will run a clean cycle and again i don't print anything until the next thing 60 hours pass it will run a clean cycle but what if i print a lot inside that window well the more i print the more residue i will build so the printer will decide if it needs to run a preemptive cleaning cycle because boy jose is sure is generating a lot of residue you see so that that is a variable and that's there it's built in it's a very smart machine it knows what to do so in a way he's right but if i if i even include that people will get even more confused they're already confused as as it is so i just keep it at the 60 hour okay and that would occur if you print a lot so if you're a very consistent printer with a pro 1000 you will see it it might be 50 hours it might be 40 hours um agitation is always going to occur the printer will actually make sure that your inks are fully suspended all the time um again go ahead and look at my uh comments go to my comment section and just look at the latest the latest video that i did canon cleaning cycles why again that's what it's called the very very latest video and look at the comments and read what apostle mamiya just wrote and provided i'm going to reply to him and thank him for that because that's really good information that's for someone who was actually using that printer pretty much consistently. A lot of us Pro 1000 users, yeah, we fail. We totally fail at putting that printer to the number of print jobs it should be producing daily, okay, daily, not monthly, 
but daily. And so that's that kind of will um, sort of explain to us. For those of you who say, wait a minute, I just noticed a cleaning cycle. It wasn't even 60 hours. Yeah, because it needed it. It needed it, so it did it. The more you print, the more you have to do it. Remember what I said and suggested and I pray about and dream about that they introduce some sort of side cleaning system that'll use a cleaning fluid rather than waste our ink in performing maintenance, which is really crazy. It would be like using the most expensive something or other to perform a menial task, you see. I want to use cheap Windex to clean a window, not not some expensive, uh, you know, three dollars per ml type fluid. No, of course not. Even though they, you know, I I still say that ink is not really that great of a of a um, solvent if it's used just for that. Now it may be it may be the case. I don't know, but they should make some sort of very almost matching type base solution. That could be used instead to clean out the print hits as you print. But I can read this if you guys want to follow me, in case you don't go back and look. I I think we should read this. Uh, let's make it big. So, okay, the 60 hour, <clears throat> 120 hour, etc. rule is not set in stone. There are many variables to this. It seems that the printer decides each time what it will do based on multiple parameters that we are unaware of. It has a mind of its own, yes. It's determining when it needs it and why. Without going into much detail, I'm still gathering data from my prints. I time each and every print prior to and after printing. I have observed roughly same cleaning cycles when printing inside the 60 hour window and when let's say after a few days. Keep in mind that the printer will do a mini cleaning cycle, pre-prime, a, a cycle prime the head before and after each and every print doesn't even matter if it's a batch print, say for Q image. Yeah, that's true. So if you print 10 images, 10 prints, let's just say 10 copies or a batch job from Q image, every print will be preceded by mini um, prime and a, a secondary prime after the print is done printing. Quick example, 50 hours from the last print I got an agitation. It's always 33 seconds, totally 101.1 minute and 24 seconds before printing starts and a minute and 50 seconds cleaning after the print's finished. These are the times. Okay, not, not, not lengths of time, but actual times when they occur. Another day after 75 hours from the last print, the same as the previous example. Well, in theory, the cleaning cycle should have been longer. It did not agitate that, that time, though. Yeah, it, it, it actually knows. Another day after 195 hours from the last print, again, got agitation. This time pre-print 1.36 versus 1.24. So slightly longer, but I will definitely say not massive difference. And after print, the same uh, 1.50. The times differ ever so slightly each time, even when printing back to back, except for agitation. That's always 33 seconds. But from what I have observed, the times pre and after the print are roughly the same. And even after 20, 200 hours. Oh, wow. Okay. So that's really good to know. Now, the printer is always on, and I've never let it without a print for more than two weeks or sometimes that long. When my data is conclusive, I will include weighing the maintenance card. I will post on your Facebook group my findings. Awesome. See, this is the kind of stuff that we need. I just don't have the time to be doing this. I really do not. This would just be beyond, you know, I not that I could not do it, but it's just beyond what I can do for this channel at this point. That would take so much time to do. And this guy is dedicating himself to, to gather this amount of data. And this is the kind of data we do because we're basically speculating from what was reported ages ago about an ancient nowadays printer, the 9500 Mark II. 
That's where all of this came from, or originally. The idea of these cleaning cycles, that's where it came from, okay? So the Pro 1000 may be a totally different animal, okay? That we, and we'll have to revise our findings as people start reporting this type of data. And this guy's really taking the, the time to do this correctly. And um, let me see someone else is... So anyway, we're going to look at this very carefully. It's the best I can do. And we'll see what that brings to us Pro 1000 users. I mean, that's what we need. We need some really good data that is actually verified by other folks. That's what we need. So let me look at the chat. I think we're done with the uh, tabs here at this point. We'll look at the chat, see what else we got. And... Maybe we'll call it a slightly earlier night. I got to eat supper. I haven't had that yet. So let's see what else we got here. We got about 30 folks here at this point still. Art Women Photography came on board earlier uh, here for tonight. Missed the last two live streams. Well, good. Happy. Happy to have you, my friend. I know you've been busy. Manuel Reiter, or Reader, um, greetings from Austria. Any thoughts on the new Epson SureColor P7570? Really, I am not familiar with any of those. And the reason being is that there's no way I can house something like that here. Okay. So I have stopped at the P800. I thought possibly, possibly, if I could find one, Maybe somebody sells, bought it and doesn't want it. A P5000, that's the one I would like to try next. For me, the P, the Pro 2000 would just be a larger version of the Pro 1000. I really don't really need that. And again, I have roll support for my P800, so I don't really need that. But yeah, I would love to see the so-called increased gamut that the P5000 supposedly brings to the table. I don't think it'll be that much different than the Pro 1000 as far as like quality of your final prints will. But again, it's supposed to have been greatly improved. It's not the dog that the 4900 was. Total failure of a printer. Wonderful printer, but it never really worked. So, yeah, I have no idea about these larger versions of Epson printers. And I think they're up to like 11, 12 colors as well. So, again... I wish the uh, SEC, no, the SE, what is it? The CES dyslexia, CES show, the Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas. I wish they would have some news about any of these printers, but there's nothing. Did Epson and Canon just decide not to, not to show up? I think so. Okay, we have Peter... Allard from Northern Illinois here. And Guido says, I have to go. Thank you, Jose. Until next week. Okay, we'll see you next week. Tango says, a question about quad, quad tone rip. Worth it. Com comparing maybe uh, Q print black and white. Wait a minute. Maybe print black and white printing. Additional information, I will be able to do print profiles at my photography school. Um, quad tone rip is one of those programs that they suggest you pay fifty dollars for it, but it doesn't force you to do that. You know, it just depends how grateful you are, uh, whether you want to pay for it or not. I'm not going to say that you should do or should not do, it. but again, it's what you need to print with the uh, piezography inks, piezography inks. Art says, uh, please remember to leave a thumbs up for Mr. J. Yes, please do that. If you like what we have seen, uh, put out here. We got 36 likes, 28 people still here. That's awesome. Thank you guys so much. And don't forget that link that I put there for the uh, twomanuals.com. Take a look at those. You'll find lots of things. Again, for those of you who like to tinker, you'll find the uh, manuals there. And those manuals are not supposed to be you know, spread up around. They're not supposed to be available for a home user. It's for only for service tech. Now, whether you will be able to perform some of the 
set of procedures you might need a um, and I don't know whether they also sell um, adjustment programs I don't know they might they might also sell those and so you would be uh, needing an adjustment program and the service manual hand in hand for a particular Epson printer usually it's for Epson printers maybe maybe for Canon printers as well but you will not see too many of those Michael Joyce says uh, hello Jose uh, Epson must be listening to you their new short color P7570 and P9570 large format printers have independent black and matte yeah uh, it's not that they're listening to me it's that they're using a larger printhead with more channels that do not require sharing here's the problem the eight channel printhead used for k3 printers and they go back you know till the 2400 okay the 2200 and they had a seven channel printer and they you had to replace let me just use a mock cart here I'll just use a Canon printer cart. You had to replace each black manually. So you had one channel for black and you print it with photo black or matte black and you replace that cartridge. It used the same chip except for a different color code. So it knew which black it was. Okay. It just allowed it to be recognized properly just in that same the same slot. Later on, they decided to add an, an extra gray to the uh, ink palette. So they went from a seven channel printhead to an eight channel printhead. And then they were still sharing that same black channel. They had nine colors now, but you know, you still shared it. So you still had to do the cartridge removal. 2880, the same thing. So now they still now they got that that really good quality eight channel printhead, but they insist on a nine color palette. So then they say, "Well, we're gonna do you a huge favor, folks. We're gonna allow you to not have to change your cartridges manually. You're gonna be able to load them, and you'll have to perform an auto black ink switch." Well, none of the manual cartridge systems existed at that point. They went to the immediately to the the, the so-called uh, stationary cartridge printers. The thirty-eight hundred came out with that, thirty-eight eighty, and all of the larger format cartridges. Anything that used that nine-color palette and eight-channel printhead. So all they would have needed to do was to make a nine-channel printhead. Now the 1900, the 2000, and the P400, they use the same inks. They have eight channels. They have eight inks. They include matte and photo black. Okay. So again, no switch needed. So why can't they just make a nine color printed? Put it on the, on the P800. That would solve that. No more, no more hassles with black. Okay, when you switch over media types, one channel is deactivated, and the other channel becomes activated. Boom, like that. It's not a a, a valve that needs to physically move and flush out ink to allow the new ink to be activated. No, it's ridiculous. The larger format cartridges, no, the larger format printers already have like an 11 channel printhead on it so sure they don't have to have black ink switch valves any longer it's just the nine color ink printers we're using that are still using eight channel printheads those are the ones that still using the antiquated black ink switch now did they upgrade it did they perform some improvements on it supposedly supposedly so I haven't heard any any kind of problems from people um, using the uh, switch mechanism on a on a P600, for instance. They failed miserably on the R3000. Oh yeah, all the time. Mine has the P800 so far. Knock on wood, still good. And so again, um, 
so far also on my even my 3800s i don't know why it hasn't failed yet you know but still maybe i use it often that's why you know that could be the reason henry stoffel says back from church hope none none of your family or friends are devastated by the recent earthquakes in puerto rico yeah that's very very sad uh i'll, I'll be frank with you guys my last relative was my father's youngest niece my family was not very big okay my family was not very large i think we'll probably talk about this a little bit and then we just call it a night um, we'll leave on that note okay so unless you guys have any more questions you want to talk about here so my grandma my grandpa they came from spain my grandma's from mallorca an island off the coast of spain in the mediterranean my dad is from galicia spain which is um opposite from catalonia which is the the two regions that one i uh, want to be um autonomous from spain so my grandma and grandpa moved to puerto rico in like 1895 when it was still under spanish rule and then after the spanish-american war and the the treaty of paris the americans took over made it a, a possession i guess um in U.S. possession, and everybody became a citizen of the United States. So then my dad was born in 1920. His siblings, he's the youngest, the baby of all of them. So he had a sister, he had a brother who died of cancer, and he had a older sister. The first child was a sister. And that child, that sister child, huh, that lady, uh, Enriqueta was, his na was her name, she married a Spaniard, very well-to-do Spaniard, who had the Fuller Brush Company in the Caribbean, the distributorship. Okay, so we lived in his humongous mansion of a home that took a whole city block, totally fenced in, gardens and fountains, and you name it, every sort of luxury you could imagine. My parents lived upstairs, they lived downstairs, and the business was downstairs. My father worked for him. So my aunt had two kids boy and a girl and then my aunt my other aunt the other girl married and had two girls she married married an american she had two redheads freckle face redheads that looked like lucille ball and then my uh aunt passed away this aunt passed away and now all of the cousins are gone so i basically have no family there I have um, probably their kids. I don't know about the two from my older aunt. I don't think they ever married. So, you know, they did not produce any siblings. But the youngest of the aunts did produce those two girls. And their offspring now are living in Puerto Rico and in Florida. So they're there somewhere. I just haven't seen them since God knows when. So, um it's really, really bad there. I mean, terrible, terrible, terrible. Just really, really sad. Um, they're just barely getting over the Hurricane Maria damage. Some of the areas have not even been touched as far as help yet. Uh, recovery, they basically recovered all of the tourist areas to bring in the tourism so that they could help the economy grow again. But then this hit, they just got hit by another aftershock just a few hours ago maybe yesterday um and so that did not help matters either i pray that you know we haven't had a tsunami or something hit okay that would be just devastating so anyway that's the situation and um, i don't know how to even approach this i just donated some money it's all i could do and um that's it that's that's where i'm at so If I print a picture from a web browser, that's a JPEG file, do I select the ICM profiles when printing? You mean directly off of a site? I suppose you can, whether that will make a difference. Now, if you right click and download it and then print it from an actual editing application, will that make a difference? I really do not know. Before I leave you guys, let me show you what I just did on my Pro 1000. Everybody's talking about that new firmware. 
and being able to print from larger sheets of paper up to 47 inches. So that means that you would need a, a roll and you would need to have a good trimmer that will cut perfect right angles to the sides. Okay, so it's nice right angle, straight edge. I have a roto trim, which is perfect for that. My, my point has always been, will I be able to feed that paper perfectly straight? Because you have 47 inches of paper, okay? So here's what I did today. I wasn't able to use, you know, to print a 47 inch long print, but what I did was I printed, um, I had a piece of roll that was at least 50 inches long, okay? And I made sure that the front edge was trimmed perfect right angles to the sides. And I just went over to QImage. I made a custom size of, uh, what was that, third, 17 by 25, which I think is probably close to the max for a, an up, unupdated Pro 1000. And I took that roll of 17 inch by the piece of paper, 17 inch by uh, 50 some odd inches. And I loaded it. And so I figure, well, I'm not going to be able to print a long panorama, but I'll be able to print 17 by 25. So I loaded my first image onto Q image. I immediately went over there to babysit my printer. It went into an agitation cycle and all of that prior to printing a cleaning cycle. Of course, I hadn't used it for several days. And I held the paper straight, as straight as I could possibly make it. And it printed. And then it spit out the rest of the paper. Once it got done with a 17 by 25, you know, paper. I had a one inch border all the way around. It spit the whole thing out. I went ahead and trimmed it off and I reloaded it and I printed two images. These are, these are crappy JPEGs that I got. See, back in the day, I used to have people send me images and I would go ahead and test them. And I did some videos showing off people's photography. That's basically what it was. So I did this just this morning. Actually, no, last night. So here's the sunset. And I'm gonna have to back up. Back up, way back here so you can see it. You see that? So this came out, I mean, perfectly aligned. So I may have to take back my words about not being able to align long papers with the Pro 1000. So I trimmed that off. Okay, I got done trimming that off. And I printed this one. Horizontal image. And again, let me back up here so you can see it. And the borders are even. They are not tapered. They are not off. They are even. So apparently I was wrong. So if you're careful enough, you should be able to line up those long sheets of paper that you guys are dying to be able to print on, on the Pro 1000. And when you send your print job over before the paper is beginning to be fed, make sure that you kind of, you know, play with it, hold it. Because even if your back paper holder is expanded maximum, you still have a lot of paper hanging on the back of it. And that could cost a little seesaw type action and you know your paper edge your front edge will not be in the correct place so you need to make sure that with your fingers you hold the paper in place until it is grabbed until it's grabbed and begins to feed once you do that then it's good to go and i suggest to you guys to set and this is something that a mac user could not find quiet mode why can't you find that i don't i don't get it let me show you what quiet mode looks like and what I mean by quiet mode is it just runs slower. And when it begins to feed the paper, it's not, it's, going to, it's not going to be a sudden grab and pull. It's going to be very, very gradual. And you sort of can control that paper as it's being grabbed initially and fed through the printer. Let me go ahead and look at the driver again. And I think that'll be the end for tonight's talk. But I want to show you what that looks like. So on a Windows machine, you should be able to see that. Let's look at the Pro 1000. Right click and printer preferences. So here we have what we need. So we go over to the maintenance tab and you have quiet settings. You see that? So right here, 
you can always use quiet mode. This is what I do all the time. I have that printer running slowly and quietly. Okay. It's going to print slower. Sure. And also here you can choose, uh, let's see. Don't detect mismatch of paper settings. And what that means is that on your, on your circle LCD, you notice that you have to pick a, a paper size and then in your driver and your computer, you might pick another paper size. You would normally get an error because they would not match. Okay. What the LCD is saying you are using would not match what you're actually setting your driver on your computer to use. So you can eliminate that problem there. Now, let me see if I could find the auto power. So here's what other people are also having problems with. I disable auto power off. Okay. No more. You have choices, enable it or, or completely stop it. So the printer will stay on constantly. There's another one here. Oh, this is, this is the one you have to use for your um, media configuration. When you create media configuration files. Hmm. I'm trying to look for the one that allows you to avoid abrasion. It's situated in a slightly different area here. This is not that. Yeah, not that either. This is when you turn the printer off. So I don't know what they, where they hit it, but on a regular, uh, lower end, uh, type Canon printer, you can find it maintenance and then custom settings and prevent paper abrasion. You see that? So apparently they may think it's not necessary for the pro one hand pro 1000. You see what I'm saying? So it may not be something that they feel you need to activate. Whereas on a Pro 10 or a Pro 100, Pro 1, it does make a difference. Okay. It does make a difference. Um, if you are getting printhead strikes on the leading edges of your prints, then you might want to activate that on your, on your Pro 1, Pro 100 and Pro 10. Another thing, um, If you guys have to ever replace the print head on a Pro 1, okay, on a Pro 100 is easy. You just open up the lid and the carriage moves to the center. Remove all of the cartridges, unclasp the clamps, and remove the print head and replace it with a new print head. Install your cartridges back on it. Clamp everything, of clamp it, of course, install your cartridges and close the lid and the printhead will reprime and you're good to go. On a Pro 10, you have to press that second button on your front panel for about five seconds and it will cause the printhead to lift and move to the center. On the Pro 1, no can do, no can do, okay? Pro 1000 even allows you to do that yourself. It's got a, a procedure that you can access through your LCD screen. If you ever have to replace that expensive printhead, you can do it yourself. On the Pro 1, they don't want you to do it yourself. So I have the instructions, okay? I have the instructions that you need to perform to allow you to perform that, that print hit exchange or reinstallation. So why would you do that? Because the Pro 1 had a problem, okay? B200 errors occur far too many times. It should not happen. And that's why they discontinued it. So there are still people out there like me that have a Pro 1. Thank goodness I have a spare printhead right now just waiting for that day when I will have to change it again. And so you guys know printheads have to be uh, replaced on a Canon printer regularly. On a, on a printer like the IPF 6440 or 6, 6400 or 6450, this is... Like the best, I forget what the capacity was, but that printer was awesome. Two print heads, and they have to be replaced like every two and a half years, okay? And it's something like five bills each one. 
So you spend like a thousand dollars just replacing printheads because they use up all of the redundant nozzles. And when one of them is out of one, when one channel is out of nozzles, each printhead has six channels. So two printheads, six plus six. When one of those nozzles or one of those, what am I saying? Channels runs out of nozzles. That's it. You got to replace the whole printhead, even though the other channels may still have lots of uh, accessible nozzles. They haven't been used yet. Yet these these printheads uh, have um, more nozzles than they need. As you burn out nozzles, that's what you're doing on a Canon printer. The unused nozzles come into play. I mean, on the fly, you don't even see it. So you don't know. You have no warning when the last few nozzles are left. Okay, and you know that in a few weeks you're gonna run out of them and you're gonna need a new printhead. That's how it works. And so that is one of the uh, things that you have to accept when you have a uh, an IPF 6400, 6450, or any of the larger Canon prior to the new Pro series. Okay. I believe that that's the way the Pro 1000 works as well. All right, um, Kevin, I really appreciate that, but we'll just leave it out of the uh, live stream. Everybody can see what you just posted. So, but I do appreciate that. Yeah, I wish, I wish. Uh, Jeff Thompson, quiet mode also easily found on the Printer Utility Pro 100 on the Mac. I don't have a Pro 10 or a Pro 1000, but I suspect it is the same. Yeah, um, somebody told me that they couldn't find it. So I, you know, I was like, why? I don't have a Mac um, computer, so I cannot go back and look at the driver configuration just to see. But I just wish that Canon, why is it, Jeff, you're a Mac user, you're a Mac expert. Why is it, before we go off, we have nine minutes before you we go off, tell me why Canon and Epson does not make a driver that has a similar, at least similar user interface. Why? Is it because of the way Mac handles color management with color sync and all of this that, that you know, of course, Windows does not use. Is it because of that um, or, or what? I mean, I think they should make, I mean, QImage for Mac and QImage for Windows. QImage 1 for Mac and Windows is pretty much the same exact uh, interface. So why can't drivers be more closely designed so that if I show you a procedure of my Windows driver for the Pro 100, you should be able to find the same setting in the same order uh, that I performed it on my Windows you know, driver. And if I did it on a Mac driver, then a Windows user should be able to also find that procedure in their driver because they're lazy. That's why Canon and Epson make no effort to make their driver layouts look similar. They're also lazy as far as making sure that when Mac announces a new OS update, everything should work, right? We should not. If I was a Mac user, I would be pissed that I would have to wait a couple of weeks for a utility to be made compatible. Come on, get off your butts. I know it's a, I know there's a difference in, you know, a percentage, you know, how many window machines and how many Mac machines are out there, but it should be the same. It should be at least similar, you know. I know there are some differences in the way the operating systems work and how they manage color, uh, but again, the the the, the so-called interface should be pretty close. Charles Rios says, "You're awesome. I have learned so much from you. I have a Canon Pro 100. I don't print for three days. My cyan clogs. Wow, really?" Uh, that has not been my experience. Um, if I don't prefer three of my cyan clogs, not all, just that one, sometimes black. Could it be that I need a pure, new printhead? Well, how long, how old is the printhead? How old is the printer? And do you refill? Are you refilling or are you just using straight OEM cartridges? That's big. If you refill, then, you know, your cartridges may be using, maybe losing their ability to feed ink. 
and it may not be an ink clog. It may be just a, a ink starvation problem like we refer to it as. Jeff Thompson says, I agree. My guess is there are many more Windows users, so they spend the majority of the time. Yeah. Baloney. I mean, come on. Nah, nah. That should not be the case. That should not be the case. The designs are totally different. And so they need to they need to sort of come to some sort of happy medium in their their you know their um so-called driver design. The user interfaces should be similar so that we can help each other out. I don't have I don't want to have to buy an, a Mac machine and load it with all my printer drivers just so I can answer some Mac user's question. And if I was a Mac person, I would not have to buy, I wouldn't want to buy a Windows machine just to have access to Windows drivers and see, you know, no, come on. Art says, I don't have a, oh, it's one and a half years old. And yes, I refill. Well, let me tell you, it could be just the cartridges. You may have to uh, start fresh with some new cartridges for those two colors. Maybe those colors are no longer those cartridge bodies. Those two cartridges are not feeding ink properly. Refill it and perform the ink test that I told you about. If you were not here early, basically you're gonna check your ink flow, okay? So you might have to rewatch it. I'm not gonna go through this over again. You might have to rewatch this and see what I'm talking about. I showed right here what you need for refilling and how to approach it the correct way. And so when a cartridge starts to not feed enough ink, don't hesitate to replace it, okay? Do not, because ink flow problems will lead to head failures on Canon printers. I don't have a Canon. My Epson driver has a quiet mode on the interface depending on the application you're using. Is there an option? Is there is is where the option is found okay charles rio says with the recommended tool you mentioned um i don't know what you mean by that you mean this thing that i made here i'm not sure what you mean okay saeed ahmad hi jose thanks for answering my icc and icm question oh you were the guy okay let's hope i will be able to add profiles from your Facebook that end in the file extension of ICM. Yeah, you should be able to. Yeah, you should. No problem. Charles Rio says precision colors. Charles Rio says, oh, I will definitely do all that. You the man. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me let me leave you with this. There is a company out there that sells through Amazon. What do they sell? They sell prints of expired patents. Some of them are quite beautiful, okay? Uh, these are blueprints. And so people like to collect these, these old historic patents uh, prints. And so what they do is they use Pro 100s. They have 100 of them. They buy PC inks by the gallons. They have people whose job is to process the cartridges as they are being used. After about 40 to 50 refills, they have to flush them out completely, rejuvenate them. Guess which cartridges go bad sooner? Cyan and one of the grays. If you look at the print hit, it'll be the two on the far right. Think about why, okay? There is, there is a theory as to why. And so that's all these people do. They print and they refill. These guys can refill a cartridge, reset it, and refill it in about 15 seconds from start to finish. That's how good they are. Okay. So they realize that after a certain number of refills, they have to either refurbish the cartridge by flushing it out and treating it with the uh, rejuvenation fluid or start from fresh with OEM cartridges and then begin that cycle again. All right, so that is it for now. I think we, we're, we're pretty good. We, we definitely ended up in a good note. We have 28 people still hanging here. We got 40 likes and some super chats. What can I say? This has been a very, very good night. And so again, I appreciate that you guys 
Um, I got a couple more videos that I need to make and upload. I'm going to start the series on photo restoration. You guys should enjoy that. We're going to do scanning procedures, how to properly scan these damaged photos so that they can be restored to some sort of, you know, better condition. And in fact, all, you know, historic photos should be scanned because they are self-destructing themselves anyway. That's just the way it is with all lab-produced prints. One more question. I had one other question. This is Said again. You use the term purge cycle, purge print. My question is, can can how can we get it as there is no option in the driver? Yeah, it's not a, it's not an available option in the driver. What I mean by purge cycle is that. Printers that have carriages that ride on the printhead assembly, the Pro 100, the Pro 10, the Epson 1400, 1430, Artisan 1500, all of these printers have carriages with print cartridges on top. When you remove one cartridge and perform whatever you want to perform on it and reinstall it, it's going to reprime all six channels or, or eight channels or all 10 channels, okay? With a little bit of ink to make sure that during this idle period where the printhead basically detached from the perch pad, that parking station on the right, and move to the center so you can perform this change of cartridge, air can be infiltrated into the printhead. And you need to push that air out. And the only way to do that is to waste a little bit of ink. That's a purge cycle. A purge print is something different. A purge print is simply a, an image that contains yellow, cyan, magenta, red, green, blue, and black. And you use that to print. When you have, <clears throat> when you have um, a situation where maybe you didn't use your printer for a while, and you have run a couple of clean cycles, and you're almost there. You're almost there, but you don't really want to waste all of the ink that would be wasted on a cleaning cycle. So you just print one of these charts, okay? And it will exercise the Epson printer. You don't want to do this with a Canon printer because you want to have complete ink flow on a Canon printer. Canon printers will be damaged, damaged if you don't have sufficient ink flow. That's why it's important that you fix that cyan problem you have. So... Epson printers, on the other hand, no damage. You can just print and you can force that last few, you know, three, four, five, six nozzles scattered throughout that were blocked. They will be clear simply by printing a set of color patches. Purge. You're purging ink out through that system. Okay. So that's what that means. So nothing, nothing really fancy about it. So he says, I can see cleaning or deep cleaning cycle, no purge. Yeah, purge is what occurs when you change cartridges. That's it. And again, it will not happen on a printer that has cartridges that are stationary, meaning they're not really directly attached to the printhead. They are sitting stationarily and they don't move. They just feed ink. So when you change one of those cartridges, you will not have to reprime the printhead because the printhead was never moved to begin with. Okay, it never moved to the center position. Thomas, uh, he super chatted us CHF10. Thank you. I'll look that up. I really don't know what that is in like dollars or anything like that. Julian Tamayo says, thank you for your advice. Uh, it's been great help with my printer choice, Canon Pro 100. And Saeed Ahmad says, thanks, Jose. All right. So I think that's it. We're going to go ahead and say good night. I'm going to go ahead and start my music again. And again, thank you guys so much again for hanging with us tonight. And again, we'll just keep doing this as long as, as long as you guys want to keep coming over and hanging with us, we'll continue to do this. So again, keep track of my latest videos that will be having. I have one drone video, battery test that I uploaded. Today will be actually up tomorrow. You should be able to see that. Again, if you're interested in some drone photography, I'm the guy to go to. And so I will take care of you guys and show you what you need to get, what you need to buy, the best approach to this type of field. 
It's again the same, it's the same photography field, just from the air, different viewpoint. So thank you so much. Bye bye everybody.